Hey Adventures, Future Tyler from the Editing Room here. Daggerheart version 1.4 is going live at the exact same time this episode releases, and this episode covers 1.3. So what we're going to do is take the episode that was originally going live today and next week's scheduled episode, shove them together in one mega episode today, and then next week, any kind of changes or anything you need to know about, we will correct that and update that right off the jump before getting into even more brand new content. So here's your heads up. Uh, enjoy this super long, like two hour episode, probably. Uh, and see you next week. Hello, adventures. My name's Tyler. And I'm Richard. On today's episode, we're going over Daggerheart's starting equipment and environments. Welcome to True Strike. Howdy, folks, and welcome back to the show. Howdy. Equipment is back on the conversation list as well as environments. Environments because we didn't cover it in as much detail as we wanted to, but equipment's because of changes. Yeah, there's actually way more changes than I initially thought. Yeah, so we looked at the equipment list and... Um, we had a lot of talking points on the last revision, mm -hmm. and we were already in the weeds on that one, so much so that it took two episodes. Yeah. Uh, so we decided that we were going to circle back to talk about equipments, because there's been some pretty significant changes to stat lines here, as well as abilities. Mm -hmm. um, most significantly, I think, is armor. Yeah. Which is at the end. So we will get to that. But more important than any of the changes to Daggerheart, in the month of May... Uh, you may have noticed this slightly different shirt than normal, than, you know, different than our True Strike logo. This is our uh, limited run of our Roll With Hope shirt, the True Strike logo. Uh, yeah, so with all the Daggerheart coverage and everything, we figured we'd make a 2D12 shirt for a bit. And a dollar of each of these sales is going to go to the Critical Role Foundation. If you would like to donate directly to them and just directly fund your money straight towards them, it is crit uh roll.com slash foundation critroll.com slash foundation you can donate any any amount you want doing great things over there um i will have a link in pretty much everything we post for the month of may uh a to their website and b if you would like to pick up the shirt and we don't make money on these shirts <laughs> <laughs> i have them priced as low as i possibly can but we do make a dollar on them, and hey. that dollar will go to Critical Role we'll Foundation. Critical Role. <laughs> so if you're interested, there you go. But yeah, so uh, we're going straight into equipment. Um, we've got uh, our sheet here. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to go through every single one of them because almost all of them have had uh, a change. There are a couple that stayed the same, but some of these are pretty significant. I don't know if uh, they're for the better or for the worse. Yeah, I've um, got takes. <laughs> yeah, I know. That's what, when we were going over it. Uh, I was already hearing your reactions. And <laughs> so I was like, stop, save it, save it. I don't want to hear your reaction right now. Because I know you have opinions. Uh, and I don't want to hear about them <laughs> until right now when everybody else can hear about them as well. Yeah. So we'll jump right in with our starting <laughs> primary weapons. The battle axe is the very first one on the list here. Now, if you're if you're looking at the old lists versus the new lists, they are not like a one to one straight across. So they did actually move some of these around in the list. Uh, so if you try and compare and contrast them, they're not in the same order uh, because some of them are completely moved around, and then some of them are just gone or replaced. So are you wanting to? Do you, do you think we should go through traits and burden and everything, or do you think we should really just point out what's changed? I think with we should all point these? out what's changed. On I agree, these guys. Yeah. Okay. So the battle axe is the first one that got a change, uh, and that is it went from a uh, D10 plus two on mm -hmm. damage to a D10 plus three. Woo! So it did get a slight buff, uh, which is kind of cool. This is not a trend that's going to stay true <laughs> <laughs> through a lot of weapons. Hey, let, out, out the jump, let's take what we can get. But out the jump, um, we do have a couple that are, yeah. you know, a bonus. So we're, you were growing up here. Uh, the next change uh, came to the Warhammers. Uh, they were a uh, D12 plus two. Mm -hmm. They're now a D12 plus three. So they got another yes. slight bump right there. Mm -hmm. The Great Sword uh, kept all of its normal abilities. Uh, it was a D10 plus two. It's now a D10 plus three. 
So again, just one damage increase across the board on all those. The next one that we have is the mace, uh, which went uh, from a D8 to a D8 plus one. So again, a yes. little bit of a buff to maces right there. <laughs> so these these micro buffs, right? Micro buffs, yeah. How do you think they came to this? Because as, as we'll get through, 90, 95% of these have changes in one way or another. Yeah. And it, some of them, to me, just feel like changes for the sake of changing mm. things. But do you think they really did see, like, okay, okay, and, and granted, maybe, maybe, uh, you know what, You're, it's a mace, it needs to do minimum two damage, right? That's the only reason I could see this plus one versus just leaving it a D8, because then, you know, oh, I hit, but it's one damage, like, oh, it's, it's a big, heavy mace, it needs at least yeah, minimum at least two. a little bit more. That is my only justification for this micro buff. Mm, I don't think so. I, I don't think that it was, I, I don't think they were looking at it to a minimum of two damage, okay. or that they were looking at it for a change just for a change. I think I would be willing to bet dollars to donuts that most of these are based on heavy math. Heavy math. Yeah. I think most of these are based my on least favorite kind analysis. of analysis. Yeah. Um, of looking at the averages mm -hmm. and damage output for these specific weapons. You think they were just slightly under? And I think, <laughs> yes, I think that they were just slightly underperforming. Okay. So these little micro boosts of like a plus one, you know, across on a couple of these weapons, I think it's just giving it a little bit of a boost. Okay. Um, will it stay that way? I don't know. I think they're probably going to still be analyzing math. And also I think for it's sure. also going to be based on interactions with abilities too. Um, so I think that's another thing that you have to take into consideration is not just the flat line stats of everything, but also yeah. how they interact with class abilities and class bonuses and buffs and stuff like that, which is a little bit harder to see. I was going to say, I know, that, I know that's, test. uh, I know that's something that's weak that we're weak with is, yeah. you know, we're like getting the weeds on these like changes on paper and everything. And sometimes we'll forget the, the greater changes, the greater <laughs> changes. Yeah. Which I mean, I'm, I'm guilty of that in almost every single video. 100%, I yep. look at a change and immediately and I'm like, Oh, I hate that change. But then you look at it and you're like, well, you know, it's considering, actually a really good change considering yeah. all of these things like A, B and C. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think that, uh, I don't think it's on a whim. I think these changes are part of a greater uh, plan essentially. So okay. yeah, I maybe I'm it. wrong. No, never. But I don't think I am. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we were on the mace. Uh, the next thing we have is short sword, mm -hmm. um, which did not have a feature before. So now short sword has the reliable feature. Yes. Uh, so now it has a plus one to attack rolls with this weapon, which is nice. So it gets a little bit something there. Uh, it did go from a D10 there we go. down to a D8. Yep. So it's not like we're getting that for free. So you're sacrificing two damage, uh, essentially, the or two on the die for a plus one to attack rolls with this weapon. Um, I can't see that I'm mad about that. No. I mean, that one seems fine. Like, I, I don't it really being have any a short issues sword, on that one. A D10 was probably too powerful, and the plus one to attack rolls, that's awesome. Yeah. So. Especially, you know, short sword, you're going to typically see your short sword and shield kind of combos and stuff anyway. So. Yeah. Nice little reliable character. Nice. nice little set. Uh, long sword is the next one. So this one yes. lost a feature because this used to have the short sword feature, mm -hmm. which was reliable. So it had the plus one to attack rolls with this weapon uh, and reliable was not on short sword. However, um, now it does not have it. So it no longer has a feature. So a long sword is just a long sword, mm -hmm. but it did get a buff. So instead of being a D8, it is now a D8 plus three. I like this. So you're losing that hit, but you're going to reliably do more damage. So it's still Ooh. reliable. Hey. <laughs> just not I, in namesake. I like uh, Short Sword having the uh, it just a feature named Reliable. It just fits Short Sword to me better anyway. Plus this having the, the bonus three on there. It yeah. Works, it works no. for me. I, I think the change to Short Sword and Long Sword are overall good. I agree. Yeah, I, I like both of those. Mm -hmm. uh, the next thing we have here is a brand new weapon which is the Cutlass. Hey. So we didn't have a Cutlass before, now we do. The Cutlass is a uh, presence trait weapon. It is a uh, melee range, uh, so just like the others. It does not have a feature of any sort. It is a 1d8 plus one for your, uh, your damage. Mm -hmm. uh, it is physical damage like everything else in here, um, but it's only a burden of one, so it's a one-handed weapon. So this is a, uh, a nice little addition. I'm never against adding new types of weapons. Uh, just for more options across yeah, the board. Exactly. Plus, Cutlass is, you know, anyone's going to want to build that piratey character. Especially yeah. Especially if they're Seaborn and stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I like it. We have uh, Rapier, uh, took the next change. 
So it is now uh, quick, um, which mm-hmm. you mark a stress uh, to attack an additional target in range, which is really, really cool. We saw that previously on the daggers in the old division. Um, it used to just have plus one agility, uh, it yeah. which, uh, which the ability on that one, which was small, I believe. Uh, so it lost small and gained quick. So now you can mark a stress to attack an additional target in range. The damage didn't change, so it remained the same. So basically the rapier is now your your fast, stabby, stabby kind of a thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, daggers, which I just mentioned, had quick, lost quick. <laughs> so daggers no longer have quick. They do not have a feature at all, um, but they did gain a slight buff in damage. They yeah. went from a D8 to a D8 plus one. That plus one. This one, micro buffs. Uh, I'm not sure. I, I know why they did it, which we'll talk about later, but it does kind of feel weird because the dagger is like when I think of daggers and I think of critical role, I think of dagger, dagger, dagger. <laughs> well, and based on that, though, your role play of dagger, 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 it's never dagger and then the same dagger again. Yes. It's always true multiple daggers yes it's multiple daggers but it's just it was weird because like i saw this and like i was reading comparing the two things and like this is the one that and that's the one that tripped me up yeah Yeah. because i'm like wait rapier has quick and dagger has nothing which is and i immediately yeah no it makes sense with a rapier right but then like my brain was all like i I must be reading this wrong like i'm getting them mixed up this Mm. is the dagger that's the rapier so i read it like three times and i was like no they just took that off of dagger completely my so I was in a similar boat, and when we went over it, I was like, "Oh, they must have moved that to the secondary dagger," which we'll get to. But they didn't. They didn't. <laughs> yeah, no, they didn't at all. So this one was the first one that kind of struck me as just weird. Um, I, I'm trying to be better about <laughs> snaps judging things without the bigger picture, and I'm not going to say that I hate it. Um, but it's just it it struck me as odd. Okay, That's I all. accept your growth. <laughs> <laughs> that's all <clears throat> the next thing we have is quarter staff uh this one like the uh first couple of um weapons got a slight buff we went from a d10 plus two to a d10 plus three Woo! so another little micro buff there the halberd uh got a um i don't, De- I don't know well, if i would say it's a b buff it's a change so it went from a d10 to a d8 plus two i'd call it a, i would call this almost a buff i would call it a buff I would call this a buff because your your minimum now is on three. the halberd is a three. Yep, which is really good. And you can still get a ten. Yeah, you can still get so that ten. In um, every way, I I shake this other than I like rolling bigger die. It's it's a buff. Yeah, it's I, more reliable. It, that's what I'm saying. At first glance, it was like, oh, it went down a die, but that now plus. it's a little bit more reliable because you're getting sure. that plus. So I don't mind that one as much. No, not at all. Uh, crossbow's got a change. Oh, actually, no. Sorry, we we're on short short bow. bow. So. Short bow. Uh, they went from a, a D8 plus two to a D6 plus three. Slight nerf, maybe? There's the math in there for like what your average is and stuff like that. But you went from a max 10 to a max nine. Yeah. But you're going to be doing minimum three instead of... Uh, but your minimum is going up. So well, Sorry, minimum four instead of a minimum three. If I was better at math, I would probably be referencing averages now. For sure. To figure out which is technically better or if they're very similar in averages. Um, but I don't know that because I'm not great <laughs> at math or averages. <clears throat> uh, crossbow is the next one on here. It went from a D eight to a D six plus one. Mm-hmm. Interesting. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> which brings me to the next thing, which is the long bow. It went from a D 10 plus two to a D six plus three. So what we're mm-hmm. seeing here is all three bows, short bow, crossbow, long bow went from D eight, D eight, D 10 to all D sixes. Every bow type in standard weapon is a D6 now with a slight modifier. So you're looking at D6 plus uh, three for your short bow, D6 plus one for your crossbow, and D6 plus three. When I look at them all together, it seems odd to me. Minimum four, minimum two, minimum four. Like, I don't know why the short bow and the long bow Mm -hmm. are identical. Other than the fact that the... The longbow is cumbersome, but the longbow is very far range. Yes. That's your difference. That's your difference. That's but I mean, like to get a uh, minus one, you're evasion, getting a minus one evasion, but you but could shoot this you're thing getting very far, very far away. I don't know. I don't know that it's enough. If I'm, if I'm, I'm not a bow player, 
right? So mm-hmm. I've never been the long distance player. That's always been you, right? Yeah. Are you going to, are you going to take a longbow? Depending on if, cause you know, everyone's going to have, have weapons in this game, right? Yeah. Am I, am I a caster? Am I benefiting from, you know, being farther away? Uh, it, it's the fact that you can engage from very far might make that penalty to evasion overall positively, you know, worth it. At least to me, it feels minimum, like it should be a higher dice. Minimum four damage is pretty good. It feels like it should be a higher dice. And I'm not saying go back to the D10. You think right? a D8? I'm thinking a D8. Because it went from a D10 to a D6. And the others went from D8s to D6s. Mm-hmm. And I feel like the longbow would feel better if it was a D8. Because then I could see taking the, the hit to evasion... I'm going to agree with you on one point and devil's advocate on the second point. Shoot. First, I picture a longbow. I picture a bigger arrow. And with a bigger arrow, because of a longbow, I do think it should do more damage. Devil's advocate, you are probably engaging before the bad guys can even engage with you. (laughs) Unless they also have longbows. Yes. Yeah. And how much damage should you be allowed to do? before most of your team can even engage. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. I, I get that. I get that. I think I think it, it it's between secondary weapons and your spells and other abilities, your domain, you know, cards and stuff are gonna really you're gonna have to build a kit for using yeah. this weapon. I, it might not actually be your even though it's your primary weapon, it might not be your primary means of damage. And I guess that's one thing that I haven't really looked at is the building of a kit. Because mm-hmm. when we said in the beginning, we're looking at these things through a lens of we're right here, right here, paper. Yeah. not how they look in the greater form of a kit. Right. So maybe there is something to be said for keeping them all at these sixes. Um, getting slightly off track, there is only one other very far weapon mm-hmm. on the list for starting weapons, and that's a great staff, right? A magical weapon. It is also a D6. So there is there no go. very far starting weapon. That is higher than that on dice. Now, to be fair, the great staff was always a D6. So maybe they were looking at the great staffs, D6, and the longbows, D10. And they're all like, this is the disparity is too great there. Why would you ever have a great staff hurling, you know, magical energy mm-hmm. for measly D6 when you could take a longbow and be hurling D10 plus two across right. the battlefield? So is it that they looked at the great staff and decided to dial it back? Or if that's the case, why not bump great staff up to a D eight? Or does that make great staff too powerful at that point? I don't know. I don't know. It just feels weird. It feels weird to me having both a short bow and a long bow effectively having the same dice. Well, not effectively. They have the same dice Mm -hmm. when the only real difference is far versus very far and minus one to evasion. For me, I, it makes the longbow very unappealing. Like, I don't think I want to take it. Like, any build that I'm going to be doing would I'm kind of surprised the shortbow is not like a plus two. Yeah. That would make a little more sense, right? Because then you'd have plus two, plus one, plus three. Yeah, because I'm not, I'm not saying the longbow needs a plus, you know, plus four, obviously. No. But it just feels weird having them both be the same. I don't know. I don't know if I have to feel about them. But we'll see. You're going to have to play a ranger. You I know. I gotta, I've got to test this you out. you got to... Kill off rivet bottom. Yeah, we're going to go with uh, something else. <laughs> I got to figure out how to build a ranger. Um, next, we have our magic weapons. Um, Arcane gauntlets. Uh, those guys went from a D10 plus two to a D10 plus three. So we're back to the micro adjustments. The hallowed axe got, uh, instead of a D10, it went mm-hmm. up to a D10 plus one. So mm-hmm. another micro adjustment. The hand runes um, went from melee to very close. That's kind of cool. Decent range buff. Yeah, that's a decent range mm-hmm. buff. And it kind of makes uh, sense, right? Because hand runes, you know, your magical it's, fists and everything right. like that. It um, That feels good. Like, I think we're making monks, or there's not really a monk build, but we're making monk builds more viable hey, at this point. I, my monk build's going to go with the rings, for sure. But, but yes, we have glowing rings next, uh, which didn't get a buff, um, but they are, you know, still pretty good. They're, they're comparable. They have... Uh, plus two to their D10. Mm-hmm. So 
you know, really the only difference between there is your traits, right? Because hand runes are instinct versus the glowing rings of agility. Mm -hmm. So it really just depends on what you're doing. But I think the hand runes getting a buff uh, was kind of cool. The The next thing we got was a short staff. Went from a D10 to a D8 plus one. So again, down a die, but technically up one on the minimum damage. True. So depending on how you look at it, could be good, could be bad. The uh, wands went from a D8 to a D6 plus one. So again, ranged weapon. Um, that's a far going down a whole die, right? So this is more in line with what we saw with the crossbow. So it's kind of the same situation. They went from a D8 down to a D6. <clears throat> the dual staff uh, went from a uh, D8 plus two mm -hmm. uh, to a uh, D6 plus three. So again, down a die, but now plus three. Yeah, it's and really four. good. A minimum of four on a far weapon. That's not bad. The uh, returning blade. This one, I this one is weird. <laughs> I don't I don't like this change. So it went from a D eight plus two to a D eight plus one. Yep. So we brought got down a, the damage. We brought down the damage. And but the thing that I don't like is that we've gone from a range of uh, far to just close i understand yeah i'm 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 before i look at statistics i always look at the thematics <laughs> i get the thematics of returning blade being close instead of far but the damage being brought down to was where it hurts um but i mean r far for throwing a blade and it coming back yeah Maybe a little too much. So close is still pretty far. So in comparison to everything else, this this seems necessary. So I don't think this debuff was necessary to returning blade uh, as a whole, mm -hmm. but I think it was necessary in comparison to everything else. Because if you left the returning blade at a plus two at a far, I'm uh, talking no, about okay. the plus. Yeah, if yeah. you left it at a far, you would have to to keep it in line with everything else. You'd mm -hmm. have to drop it a die. Because if you look at all the other, yeah, all the other ones have dropped to a D6 right. to match up. And this one didn't. So it stayed, uh, it stayed as D8. So if they were to keep it as far, they would have had to drop it to a D6. Fair enough. So the question there would be, would you rather have? Would you rather have it be far and a D6 to keep it in line with the other far weapons? Or do you think it's better to have the higher damage and making it a close returning blade? I think, I think this is I think it's better at close. You think it's better as close? Uh I mean yeah, call me crazy, but I do. Okay. I think I agree. Like I think that means I got it right cuz you're always right. <laughs> the more that I think about it and the more that I compare it to everything else, uh my knee jerk reaction when I saw this was ouch cuz it's two sucks. two yeah. debuffs. Yeah. Uh but the more that I compare it to everything else, I think this was probably necessary. And I think I would rather have it be close and mm -hmm. not give up that D8. Because I want that possibility to hit nine on a, a blade that can return to me, which is really, really cool. I mean, we're talking what comparatively close is what? 30 feet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's plenty. Far that's plenty far. For yeah. That's a blade. It's plenty far and it doesn't overpower it versus, you know, like all your bows. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, the next thing we have is the scepter uh, mm -hmm. that went from a, a D eight plus two down to a D six. Woof. Again, far range taking a die hit. So, Keeping in line with everything else. And no plus. Yep, that D8 is going right back down. Uh, the Great Staff, we mentioned this one before, went from a D6 plus 2 to just a D6. Now, it's important to mention on the Scepter really quick before we get too far from it. Mm -hmm. It is versatile. Yes. So you can, you know, do yeah, you can this use thing. it as a melee weapon uh, Yeah, or, at a D10. Right. Yeah. No, which is good. Yeah, for sure. Uh, but again, it's that whole, it's distance. They yeah. really seem to be basing their die, their damage die, yeah. on the range that your weapon has. Mm -hmm. So it looks like anything that's going to be far is going to be a D6 right, right. across the board. Um, same thing with very far. So the Great Staff is the only other very far weapon on here other than the Longbow. Uh, so it went from a D6 plus 2 down to just a straight D6. Mm. So that's the only thing about the Scepter and the Great Staff. Um, they both uh, lost their modifiers. So yeah, but... now they are flat. But they Why? both have extra traits, which the others don't. So, you know, like you said, with the scepter, you can use it as a melee attack. 
And then with the great staff, it has even something better, which is powerful. You'll yeah. roll one extra damage die and drop the lowest. So you're giving up those modifiers for extra abilities, which I'm all for, I think. That's that's what's interesting if you look at the longbow compared to the great staff, right? And then both being very far range and stuff, different, you know, yeah. traits, of course. But one having the plus three, so you got that minimum four damage. But one could be, you know, if you're rolling two dice, it could be six. But is your average going to end up being higher than the four guaranteed from the longbow? Yeah. You're not taking that evasion hit. You're not taking the evasion it's hit. good. Yeah. I I think, like, if I was building a character. Yeah. Um, and, of course, knowledge and agility. Very different very traits. Very different traits. Yeah, yeah, that's the thing. Those are very different traits. But if I was going to build a character around a weapon, right? So if I was going to build a character where I was planning on staying in the back, mm -hmm. I think I would be going with the great staff. Um, so and that's just because on average, we're probably going to be doing slightly less interesting damage, but I, I don't know, I, maybe not. I mean, at the end of the day, you're, you you've got very few options if you're building towards knowledge anyway. Well, yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Not bad. <clears throat> I, I do like that they are different enough. For oh like, yeah. Oh, they're both a D six, but there's pros and cons to both outside of traits entirely that make them very different to where, like you said, you can build towards one of them and not feel like you could dip into the other one. Oh yeah. Like for they're sure. not, they're close. Yeah. They're not close in that respect. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Our, uh, starting secondary weapons, uh, daggers, they changed, uh, from a dagger, um, and now they're small daggers. Yay! I like <laughs> so this, this change. So this is a neat change because it's less confusing. Yes. Right? Because then it's not just dagger and dagger. It's dagger and small dagger. And there are a couple things in here. What we're about to go over on the na just the names of these secondary weapons that have either changed it completely or slightly changed it. Mm -hmm. And I appreciate that. Because yeah. you, when you were like, well, it's still a dagger. Why is it different? Yeah. Why well, is it different? It's your secondary it's dagger. It's a different dagger. Now it's, it's a secondary dagger. A small dagger. Yeah. Now it's a small dagger. Yeah. So yeah, this is hugely necessary. Um, just these clarifications make things so much easier. Yeah. Again, the um, the small dagger hasn't changed anything. So as far as features are considered, it's still a paired weapon, which means you get a plus two to your primary and melee. Mm -hmm. But again, we go back to that whole daggers and multi hits. Um, we don't see that on daggers anymore. Yeah. Dagger, so dagger. If you want the if you want the multi hit, it's now rapier dagger. Yeah. <laughs> so your rapier rapier dagger is what you're gonna get instead of dagger dagger dagger. Ooh man. And if you're it's harder to say, rapier dagger, dagger. Rapier, just rapier, rapier dagger. Oh, you're right, you're right. Yeah, because you're doing rapier, rapier. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I do love the paired ability though. The plus two primary weapon damage and melee. Oh no, that's amazing. Ooh, yeah, that's awesome. That is that is very very cool. But you know what else has that ability? Mm, the uh, new weapon, sort of, sort of. So <laughs> short sword used to be here, uh, and that has been completely removed because again, we don't want a short sword and a short sword. Uh, and they have replaced this one with a saber. So uh, the saber is the same um, trait. So it's agility. It's the same range, melee. It's the same uh, feature, which is the paired. So the plus two to the primary. Uh, but it has a different damage die. So instead of having a 10, it is now an 8. So the short sword effectively uh, went down a damage die and became a saber for slightly more clarification. The whip uh, changed its trait to agility instead of presence. Well, this makes other way around. Or sorry, instead of uh, its presence instead of agility, mm -hmm. um, which uh, I think makes sense. I'll take it. Yeah, I'm fine with that. It's it's the only presence trait, you know, based secondary weapon. Well, that's the thing is that like before everything was you know agility, finesse, or strength. There wasn't another option in there. Yeah. So having something that's in there and it does kind of make sense right mm -hmm. like i'm i'm okay with that the grappler also changed its trait so it was also agility and yep. now it's finesse so we have another take finesse weapon in here um neither of the damage i changed on those none of the features changed no, on those whips are still amazing with the whip crack ability it's real cool <laughs> love it if you don't know what that is it's mark stress to scatter enemies in melee back to close range get back fifi get back it is such a cool ability and i want to make a whip master <laughs> <laughs> which I have one in 5e. Yeah. You have I, two whips. I never got to play him. Yeah. Now you only have one whip. Yeah. <laughs> the uh, crossbow uh, had its change. It is now a hand crossbow. So instead of having, you know, crossbow and crossbow, now you have a hand crossbow. And yet, 
It was also brought down. No, brought up. It was brought up. Yeah. Yeah. So it went from a D6 to a D6 plus one. That's better name. Better damage. Yeah. So it's the it's the exact same functionally. So the crossbow and the hand crossbow, both are D6 plus one. Um, Sweet. They're both far. They're both finesse. The only change is one's a hand crossbow and one's a crossbow. <laughs> yep. And these were all the changes done on this equipment list. There's nothing else. Uh, if only armor took a pretty massive hit. So our yeah. our starting armor, um, first up is leather armor. It used to have a feature called light, yep. which gave you a plus one to evasion. Really cool ability. Which was really, really cool. It's yep. gone. It's just um, gone. It's just gone. Uh, yeah. Leather armor is now the only armor that doesn't have a feature. So it's just armor. But not only uh, not a feature, only only one without a negative feature. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's just, yeah, it has no feature, negative or positive. But its base score uh, also went down. Yep. It went from a three to a two. A 50% reduction. Oh, that that's, that's a lot. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's a lot. So, ba- you know, top, top level and everything, we're looking at all these things like, oh, cool. They're giving you more like armor slots and stuff. Yeah. Out the jump, you can, fo- you know, your thresholds are being changed in b- a bit, but you can use your armor more often. Well, who cares? Your armor sucks now. <laughs> yeah. So this is where <laughs> not covering the equipment All when we thing. covered the other stuff yeah. is biting us because this would have changed the discussion as far as, at least I think, as far as the armor class uh, changes, the armor slot usage and the damage it, thresholds. Does it though? It does. Because it's still positive they gave us more armor slots. I'm not changing my mind on that. No, that's great. That is still positive. (laughs) Incredibly necessary. But the further down this list we go, the bigger the disparity gets or seems to get. It's it's the last one here. We'll we'll get to it, but I, I don't understand it. Yeah. So, okay. So we have leather armor has no features and now is a two base score instead of three. Breastplate armor uh, had nothing for a feature before, so it was the only one with a blank feature. But now it gets a feature. Uh, now it gets a feature, which is stiff, which yeah. is minus one to agility. What the heck? Ouch. Um, Why? Yeah. I, this minus one, is, one? It's your second tier armor, and you're yeah, getting a negative tier armor. for not having nothing. Yeah. And, it's, and you're not it's getting stiff. a lot more. And that, and here's where the real kicker comes in. Because that, you're all like, oh, gosh. But it's still five armor, right? No, it's three. It's what light, or sorry, leather used to be. Yeah. So it's it's three now. So you're down from a five to a three. So not right. only are you taking a, a negative one to agility, only getting three armor for that negative one. Wow. Who? Oh man! However, okay. it is fifty percent better than leather. It's well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's that's definitely the bright side. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, so it can only get better, right? Um, we had <laughs> we got chainmail. Uh, chainmail was uh, heavy minus one to evasion. It still is. Hey, so didn't get worse. We're consistent. It didn't get worse yet. <laughs> um, so it went from a seven base score down to a four. Yep. Okay, that, oh man, this is, this is rough. Finally, you go to full plate armor. Uh, so very heavy, minus two to evasion, minus one to agility still. So it still has those negatives for it. But before we were dealing with a nine base score of armor, which was amazing. And everybody that read this was like, even like even on Critical Role main channel, yeah. Like when they were building Travis's character, he's like nine armor. It's gonna be crazy. It's gonna be so cool right. having nine armor. I'll be able to tank all this damage. I- I'm gonna get hit all the time because of the negatives. Yeah, you're gonna get hit but all the time. At least but I'll at be least, able to tank it. Yeah, at least you'll be able to tank it. It's gonna be good. It it went down. So instead of nine, we're all the way down to five, which is our former second tier, because that was breastplate. So the second one up used to be five. So now all the way at the fourth level of starting armor, you're only just hitting what was previously the level two. I'm missing something. I have to be right. And maybe it's something we talked about last week or the week before because, you know, time removed. But 
What the heck? Why, this seems why would harsh. I why would I choose full plate? Yeah, this seems harsh. Yeah, why well, I don't know negative why. Negative two to evasion. I'm gonna get hit all the time. Negative two to evasion, negative one to agility, Ugh. and all you're getting out of this is a five. I don't I I'm at the point now where if I was making a character, yeah, maybe, you know, of course you get into like actual character math and everything, but I'm looking at leather and I'm looking at chainmail. I I don't know. This makes if you really don't care at all about agility, maybe breastplate's fine. Maybe breastplate's fine if you're really not caring about agility. But other than that, my base my base armor is gonna be leather. And then if I really want more more if I want to go the armored route, I'm gonna go chainmail. Because yeah. full plate's too much for not enough. Full plate it seems yeah, that seems like way harsh. There's gotta be some specific build that min maxes this. That that's it, what I'm, that that's makes what I'm getting it, at. That makes it not so horrible, mm-hmm. but it just seems like that you're going to have to. You're going to really have to play with min-maxing to make full plate worth it, Yeah, it seems. I don't know. I mean, they with the, all the changes that happened to the slots, the armor slots, and the damage thresholds, it makes sense that they would want to adjust these. Yeah, But sure. this seems like an overcorrection to me. And maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it's not an overcorrection and it's the exact right amount of it's correction the perfect necessary amount of correction. Uh, based on specific builds that I'm not taking into account right now. Yeah. But I don't know. Uh, it To me, this seems like a vast overcorrection and I don't see a use case scenario for full plate armor anymore. Theron Keen, if you're in the comments right now, uh, do me <laughs> a favor and uh, tell me why we're wrong. You're the best at pointing out the things that we missed. Very, very insightful. Yeah. So, yeah, that's uh, out of everything that changed on the equipment list. I think the armor was like the biggest shock, right? Because that one has like the most drastic change that is hard to wrap my head around. I love that it's at the bottom, too. And it's at the bottom. Because I'm yeah. just like, ah, la, 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 la. oh, these numbers seem a little different. Oh, yeah. It was funny because we were going through and, uh, you know, like writing down notes for the show. And I was telling him some of the changes and uh, the general reaction that you had to most of them was like, ooh, ah, ee. And then we got to the bottom and we started going over the changes to armor. And that's when you really started to have that, you were like, uncontrollable reaction. Don't say a word. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm going to tell you a number here. D- don't overreact. <laughs> Don't think about it too much. Just write it down. <laughs> I'm pained just thinking about it. At period. <sighs> it's interesting. Overall, um, what are your opinions on most of the weapons and everything? I know what your opinions are on the armor. I know what your opinions are on the armor. My opinion of the armor, though, even is is muddled. Is muddled because, like, like you said, uh, we're we're really terrible. And looking at the whole forest <laughs> when we're in the middle of it and we're checking out this nice tree. Yeah. So I, I I admit there's probably some cool builds or the amount of armor slots you get or something that makes it to where this little or maybe they're just trying to make the game a little more a little more uh deadly. Maybe it was a little too easy. Right. You <laughs> I think? Know. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. But this if not, then yeah, major course correction issue. Maybe they're brilliance of play testing though right yeah they could just be extreme oh yeah no just like dump it and highs and see how bad it gets right and then just just see what we get yeah because who knows maybe maybe they drop it and they get a you know some cool reports of players being like oh i love the grittiness of it <laughs> because <laughs> any wrong move <laughs> oh yeah disaster <laughs> any wrong move and you're squish. i don't know oh but just you know hot take Oof, ick, gross. Uh, Weapons, overall, I get what they're going for. Uh, Micro buffs, like I said, increasing that minimum damage, the way I was looking at it. Cool. Minimum damage increase, always fun. Um, Yeah, I don't, in the the bows, other than maybe the long bow going up to a D8, or the short bow being brought down to a plus two, I don't know where that works out a little better. Maybe that. But, like I said before, you do have that range difference. Maybe that's all you needed. No, the glaring issues that I yeah. can think of. I do. I love the renaming of the secondary weapons for clarification. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. What about you? No. Overall, I, I like everything that's there with the exception of the longbow. 
that's the only one that just still seems a little bit off for me. I want to, I, I want to see a greater argument to using a longbow. What would you change if you had to fix it right now? If I had to fix it just, right now, yeah. it would, I, my gut reaction is to say, uh, to increase the die back down, but then lower the modifier by one. Hmm. So make it a, instead of a D six plus, uh, three, uh, three, is that what it is right now? Yep. I would make it a D eight plus two. Okay. That would be my my quick fix for it that I think would make I would so have you're actually zero lowering, complaints. You're lowering the minimum damage. The minimum damage. Does that actually fix it? I don't know. And that's why I'm saying I'm not the math guy. Yeah. Right. So I don't know if because that if actually you do fixes that, it. Does it make it feel better? Yeah. It makes it feel better. It makes it look better on paper. I was gonna say if but you do that, mathematically, we'd your, have to do that behind the scenes to figure out if it actually is. Your max damage is up plus one. Compared mm-hmm. to the short bow, max, max, your yes. minimum is down one. Your minimum is down one. And your tail, you're still taking that negative to evasion. Is it meaningful enough? I think you could do a D8. And just leave it with and, the plus. And be fine, because you are getting that evasion. Ne- uh, oh, that's true. Yeah, I was. Yeah, I forgot about the evasion negative. So yeah, maybe that's it. But yeah, that's, that's the only thing. Um, I mean, other than the armor. Because it did, it did look. I mean, you know what? Sorry. Uh, the others dropped from an eight to a six. This one dropped from a 10 to a six to a six. Yes. Why skip an eight? That's because everything at that yeah. range dropped down to a D six. Right. Which I think is not the right thing for the longbow. Okay. That's the only right. thing that I have. Everything else I'm and okay your great with. staff, which is very far is a very different kind it's of a weapon very different because kind of knowledge of weapon. and yeah. powerful is its own very powerful trait. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Teacher. So I think that one's fine. And like I said, everything else on here is okay. The only thing that, like I said, stands out to me is the longbow. Okay. Everything else I uh, I like, everything else is fine. The naming uh, changes is really, really good. Um, the I know why they did the dagger rapier switch thing. It's just that I get it my, my brain is so coded for the dagger to be that thing and not a rapier. Um, but on... on Outside of that, outside of that hard wire that we have to think of daggers as the multi-attack weapon, it's not that, you know, huge of a deal. I'm, I'm actually a little, as much as I like the paired feature, right? I'm kind of almost confused by it. I understand narratively, you're probably, you know, getting in there and taking that secondary swipe with your small dagger or saber. And that's where that plus two damage is really coming from narratively. But... Why isn't it a just you take a second attack with that weapon? Yeah, I don't know. I think probably for just balance issues. Yeah, I mean, it's like, oh. Because then there's no reason to take the rapier. Because, so that's the funny thing about the small dagger and saber. Like, when are you actually, unless you're, you know, a class that's actually using your secondary weapon as, you know, take a straw as your secondary action. The small dagger and saber are basically just there to increase your primary weapon damage. I yes. mean, are you actually using it for anything else? I mean, depending on your build, yeah, you could be. Mm-hmm. But yeah, no, that's exactly why. But it's that there. paired. Yeah, that paired feature is really, really nice. You know what? Let's look at these shields. Because the tower shield, for example. I know, I'm all over the place now. And I'm bringing this one up specifically because it's the big boy shield. And it, it it's, it's still a plus four, right? Yes. So if you have the tower shield. You drop your evasion by two, but you have a plus four to your armor score. That with full plate, even right now, puts you at a negative four evasion, negative one agility, but a nine armor score at level one. Yes. Maybe they had to do this. Maybe a four or 13 armor at level one was too much for one slot of armor. Yeah. To have an a 13. If you go max tank, you still can tank. I need to see it. But I think the shields are the answer here. The shields are the reason why they did that. Uh-huh. Yeah. I Which, think if you, we didn't cover the shields because the shields got no changes. Right. The shields remained the same from the original and equipment list. They did not bring down the yeah. armor. They did not. Yeah. So. Because, yeah, even if you just have a round shield with the plus two with no negatives... It's a plus two. Now you're looking at a seven. Or sorry, out the jump, you'd have a, a four, a five, a six, or a seven. Yeah. But then, you know, 
are you how many classes are going to be taking a shield? How many people are going to be taking a shield? Is a shield now required? I think a shield, if you're going armor, you have to go shield. That's what I'm saying. Is a shield now it's required? Because I'm thinking equipment. 5e, paladin, plate mail, great sword, right? Decent AC. No, no shield, big sword. But now that would put you in such a place. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. Hypothetically, right? You've got a great sword. That's a negative one agility. <laughs> Your full plate, a negative one agility. So you've got a negative two evasion, a negative two agility, a five armor, and your dish your dish has some decent damage, D10 plus three. Whew. But if that's your if that's what you're willing to do. You know what? I can see this working. Oh I, no, I, I can, can see, see it, it working. I can see this. I can see it working, but I just wonder how much it's going to change builds across. Cuz I'm thinking even man, even an 18 in like 5e for example wasn't unhittable. By any means. Oh, no. Especially in the position I was as being a melee fighter. Or, you know, paladin, but melee. I was constantly getting whooped. <laughs> even with an 18. The system uh, is a lot different, though. So it's not oh, really for comparable sure. to 5e in that respect. I don't know. We'll have to five. see. I'm curious to see what, like, um, more people play testing this see. Uh, mm -hmm. Like, widespread Absolutely. across the board what people think Native of this. Evasion. Uh, because we're going to see a lot of different builds utilizing this stuff, or maybe people just avoiding it altogether. Yeah, right. So I, I feel like we're gonna have to make a few, like, make a few builds going down the uh, class list. Oh yeah, no, and just compare what we're looking at. Yeah, what we're looking at on paper. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and roll some dice. I love rolling dice. That's why we're all here. <laughs> but overall, also preemptive thanks, uh, Theron. Uh, good math. Yeah. Overall, uh, this stuff is um, pretty decent changes across the board. So I can't say that uh, I think too negatively of equipment outside of the initial reaction for armor. I don't know whether it'd be angry or not anymore. I don't like <laughs> it. I want to. I want to feel strongly one way or the other. <laughs> well, you you can feel strongly. So that's it for equipment. There's a lot of pages here. There's a lot of pages here. I don't think these are going to take as long as that <laughs> one no. single page. Yeah. Mostly because uh, I plan on actually going through all of it. How much have you gone through these? So uh, I've looked at, and what we're talking about right now is environments. Yes. Yeah, because this was something that uh, we didn't really touch on too greatly. A little um, bit. We touched on it very slightly mm -hmm. as far as like our overall thoughts on it i guess uh, yep. but we didn't really go too much deeper into that um and i have looked at some of these uh, and i think they're amazing yes essentially it's just taking the thing that it, it's always present in you know tabletop rpgs and it's giving them optional stat blocks and scenarios and things like that and it's just kind of nudges your gm to use the environment in creative ways um, the first cut would read the first couple of paragraphs. This explains it in their way. Environments represent everything in a scene that is not the PC or the or the adversaries, from the physical elements of the space to the background characters and forces of nature. Much like the adversaries, each environment has a stat block that provides a framework for influencing the PCs and the wider scene. These aren't restricted to combat, as you can use the adversary stat blocks to enhance any scene from festive galas to crumbling ruins. This is awesome. Yes. So skip the rest of this first page. There's an example thing we might double back to. But each stat block contains the following elements. You've got a name, just the name of what it is, like the, the baronial court. There is the type. This is going to be the environment's type. Uh, it's going to be stuff like social environment, traversal, um, or social, or sorry, exploration. Exploration, social, and traversal. Um, you've got tiers. 
which tells you exactly or roughly what level your players should be going to these kind of environments. Um, that would be tier zero for your level one and up characters, your tier one for your two to four, uh, tier two, to your level, uh, character levels five to seven and tier three levels eight to 10. Mm-hmm. Um, you've got a description, which is like a one line summary of the environment tone and feel. It just kind of lets you know what kind of emotional notes the GM should focus on when explaining it to uh, the players. So like the baronial court has a mood that is playful yet tense. It's rich with the smell of food, perfume, and wine. Um, You've got a difficulty associated with each of them that tells you what kind of checks basically your character is going to have to make for most roles there. Now, some adversaries might have more difficult checks. That's on a per, you know, per character, per adversary basis. That's, that's totally fine, but you get that baseline. Uh, potential adversaries, so it lets you know some things that might be there, and features. Uh, they could be dynamic environment, um, actions, or passive things that are always happening for the GM to like take note of. Um, so to get to run through those, right? So this baronial court, um, its description would be the bustling court of the baron, lavishly decorated with tapestries, crystal goblets, and attendees dressed in finery. Your tier is tier zero. So this is for your level one players. It's a social type with a difficulty 12. Potential adversaries could be a courtier, merchant, a petty noble, or bladed guards. Uh, features that it has, oh, sorry, tone even. Playful yet tense, rich with the smell of food, perfume, and wine. It has a uh, few features, including things like you scratch my back, which is a passive. A PC may gain advantage on a presence roll by offering or cashing in a favor. If the PC fails to deliver on repaying a flavor favor from this feature, the GM will take two fear. That one's neat because how long, right? If you're running this game, is this something they need to pay back pretty quickly? Yeah. Is this like, oh, at some point in the future? And if it's like days, weeks, months, whatever, does your GM grab fear then? Is this got to be an in the moment kind of thing? Either way, I like that there's stakes on the line here. And they even throw in some like uh, some text to kind of like prompt the GM to think about these things. Like, for example, for the you scratch my back, what secrets are concealed within the favors requested? How long does the PC have to make good on their promise? There we go. Uh, Gossip, which is a reaction. When a player character fails a presence roll with fear, they must mark stress as their failure becomes the hot gossip for the evening. I love that. Right? Um. We meet again is an action uh, an NPC or or you know adversary or not can take, uh, but NPC uh, previously known to the party appears to the court with an agenda. What do they want from the PC? Like that's just an action. You can it just take. There's there's you don't got to spend anything. It's just a hey. While you're here, you could have this social encounter happen, and then this one I like. It's framed. It is an action, and you have to spend a fear to do it. They spend a fear to have a prominent member of the court frame a PC for a crime real or imagined. Proving your innocence requires completing a progress countdown six. So this is one of those things where your GM is going to tell you what's happening and they're going to throw a D6 on the ca- on the table. And you've either got six actions or whatever to like get this, get yourself unframed. You got to pass these difficulty checks. Otherwise, it's gonna, you know, it's going to go down. So that's cool. And that's, these are just optional little flavory bits. They're like, here is a location. These things can happen. You don't have to use them. You might want to use them. I'm my assumption is every dagger heart campaign or module is going to have environments laid out like this. Yeah. And I think that's kind of what they're going for, Mm -hmm. which is like anytime that you're, they're going to present a campaign or a story or something like that. They're going to have set pieces Yes, that are going to use these, and it actually they they have a thing in here where they talk about this too, which should be said is like you said, these are all optional, mm-hmm. uh, but they're also mutable, right? So you could take all of these and take your favorite bits from them, yeah. to create your own environments. Yes, so you can 100%. go through all the stuff that's in here, and you can be all like, oh, I really like how this thing interacted in that environment, mm-hmm. and I think it would look cool in this environment that I'm building here. Absolutely, and it's just another tool which I love. I like having extra tools and I like having stuff like this. And it just gives you so much easier way to add flavor to a scene. 
Yes, and I and I think that's the idea of all of this is not only do they have these examples, but all the examples are just showing you how it's done. Right? Yes. And, and like one of the other fear moves they give you here as an example, even not in the same environment, but it it I'll get to it. Uh, it's called Patient Hunter. It is an action and use a fear. Spend a fear to summon an acid burrower who burst up from the ground where they have been waiting for prey. The acid burrower immediately takes the earth eruption action without spending action tokens. Things like that, where you can have your traversal scenes or even your social scenes, um, and you can have bad things randomly happen, but you're not just doing it. You're spending a currency. You're like, hey, I've got all this fear stockpiled. I feel yeah. like causing a little bit of chaos. Bloop. Guys, guess what? And I don't know. It's neat. And then the fact that, like I said, these campaigns and stuff are just going to kind of give you these ideas. It should all flow in pretty naturally. Yeah. It's rad. I like that the, my I think my favorite part of this environment's edition that they put in this book is that they didn't just use like random things. So they have set aside mm -hmm. uh, a bunch of different tiers in here that are very common themes in standardized games. Mm -hmm. So these are very easy for you to just pluck out of this guide and just use as is. Oh, absolutely. Because yeah. like you have the one that's the court, right? So it's a, you know, the, how many times you've been in a game where you found yourself in a royal court or at a royal party or something like that. Yeah. This can be plugged directly into that. The other things that we have on here are the abandoned grove, right? So mm -hmm. a nice abandoned forest grove, a bustling marketplace, which is, again, super common, bustling marketplaces. Yeah. You have a raging river. Uh, you have an underground cave. So these are all like like real, like legit things that are very commonly encountered in e low level, mid level, sometimes even high level play. Yep. And then you get to the even higher level ones. They have the ruined tower and the mountain pass. Uh, again, you're increasing in tiers on these, right? So you're going to the higher tiers now. But depending uh, on it, not even the tier doesn't even necessarily affect the difficulty. No, but yeah, they are scaling in difficulty, right? So when you get up to the tier ones, you're looking at like difficulty 15s, the tier twos, you're looking at difficulty 16. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't use those in lower level play. No, no, no. Right. You'll means... just have to probably adjust some of the stuff that's in there. there. There's a little bit because even the like what? So we've got a couple of tier ones here that range from 13 to 15, depending mm -hmm. on difficulty. But we've got a bunch of tier zeros to give here. And uh, the underground cave, for example, is a difficulty 10. Yes. And yeah. mostly because of that being an exploration kind of thing, like your checks, you, you've only got to get a 10 to pass most of this stuff. Yeah. And it's there's no pressure for the most part of. Like you know, social situations yeah, social for the difficulty in there stuff. would yeah. be more difficult. But yeah, if you're, you know, explain or sorry, exploring, uh, like <laughs> air that's uh, burning you and stuff like that. Yeah, your difficulty is a little bit higher. <laughs> oh yeah, it's definitely going to be higher there. Yeah, but I, I like the fact that the, a lot of the ones that they give you in here are the most commonly used. Because it gives you a really good jumping off point because a lot of these can be changed and muted to be whatever you need it to be to fit something yeah. that is in your campaign already or that you're already facing. And we're going to be getting more. Yeah. We don't include any examples of tier three. Yes. No, we don't see that but yet. Yeah. Coming soon. Coming soon. Yeah. And the first thing that I thought about when I saw this was like layers, right? And layer actions. Yeah. Because that was like the first like direct parallel to mm -hmm. Dungeons and Dragons that I saw on this. And I was like, oh, it's a layer. <laughs> Right. And you have layer actions. Yeah. But it's deeper than that because it's not just layer actions. There's a lot of stuff here that helps both uh, the game master and the players. Right. Because yeah. if you have something like this, it's a lot easier to frame your scene for your players and get them more immersed into it in a way that makes them feel more part of the scene. It's to me, it's that you're, you're not just using this for your big boss battles. Yes. This is how you're going to frame most environments, whether it's just a quick dinner or, you know, traveling from town to town or exploring a cave. Yep. This is, this is your framework for setting up an area and it gives everybody a little bit more to play with. And it's a really good jump off point for your GMs to just figure out how to add detail 
that matters. To yeah, that games. matters. Yeah, which I was going to say is to be fair, technically, you could do all this stuff already. 100%. Right? So this was all part of scene building uh, that game masters over time develop as skills. Yeah. Right? So you have, you know, like DMs that have been doing this for a long time can set up a scene and can build the scene with all this interesting things that they can have happen where you plan this thing out ahead. And sometimes you plan down to the very little details. And sometimes you don't, sometimes you set a scene and you let your players interact and figure out how they're going to change the scene and how you're going to do things. Mm -hmm. So you could technically always do this, but this is just another level and another layer Mm -hmm. and another tool. And I think my favorite thing about this is it's going to, in adventures so modules that they're going to release for this yep i think that this is going to be incredibly cool to see in modules because it's going to be giving you so much more to work with right off the jump yep because now they're they're not just saying okay well here's your players this is the next point if they choose path b they're going to go here to a a ruined tower full stop And now you have to fill out that ruined tower. You're going to fill out all the information and then you're going to come up with hazards or actions they might have to do. And if the module is like, okay, we're going to go to the ruined tower, go to this page. This is a tier zero environment with a difficulty of 11. Mm -hmm. And here are, you know, this is the tone and the feel of this tower. So you can use that as your jumping off point as a descriptor for your party. It looks like this. It smells like this. Yeah. Here's a passive, uh, there's a fog permeating the air makes, you know, difficulty for these checks. And yep. Yeah. And just, then from there, you have all these other things that are, you know, possible features and things that can happen. In right. There. So this is going to make modules, I think, super cool. Oh, I love this. Yeah. I love this so much. Yeah. And, and this is not something that I expected to see either. Oh, me neither. Yeah. I like, expected it to kind of be a one to one from previous, you know, tabletop games. Yeah. And like you said, they all have them, but this going out of its way to give you so many, you know, tools on building yourself, but then specific examples. And, and I mean, they really do like they're for being a play test. That's not even finished. There will be more examples oh, yeah. and it's already like amazing. And as you know, you're going to get these modules and stuff and players and GMs are going to be running through. It's just going to get locked into your mind that this is how environments are explained. Yes. And then it's as you build that like muscle memory <laughs> of when in, you know players come into an environment, you explain the environment based in this kind of format, you'll just start doing that without having a module. Yeah, without having it there. And like you said, a lot of, you know, experienced GMs and DMs will do that anyway. But the the guidelines on this are so good. It's not just a picked up skill, it's taught to you. Yeah, it's taught to you. And then, then the other thing is is that like I mean I've DM'd games before mm-hmm. and I know that when you're in the moment or sometimes mm-hmm. you're building a scene, you don't think as deeply as you could have into a scene mm-hmm. until after the game is over. Mm-hmm. Right. And then or you go before, back and then you forget in the moment. Yeah. And then you forget in the moment you go back and you're like, man, that scene would have been a lot cooler had I introduced this or had yep. I done this. And I know for a fact that I'm going to be presented with these environments in the future that I'm going to look at and I'm going to be like, I didn't think of that. Yeah. That is such a cool thing to add in this environment that I would have never probably put in myself because I'm not a game designer. It's, it's one of my personal biggest weaknesses as a GM is actually saying all the things I'm thinking because there's so much, right? You're, you're, you're keeping track of what all your players are doing, what your adversaries are doing and, you know, plot threads and are they messing, are they going against everything you thought they were going to do? And then you've already introduced the environment, but there's more to it. And you could flesh that out a bit and you just start to picture it as you talk and you're going through the dialogue and you have it there in your mind. But just unless you've gotten to the point where the first thing you do is fully set the scene, sometimes you just get away from it. Yeah, you get away from it. It's there and you know it's there, but it doesn't mean you actually set it. (laughs) And sometimes modules will go into detail, and then a lot of times they don't. A lot of times you get a, as you approach this church, you notice that the walls look like they've been scraped against large beasts, and there's shattered glass on the ground, and that's it. And yeah. you're like, okay, well, and that's all I guess you get. it's pretty like, you know, you know, gravitated church, and what's the inside look like? Oh, they don't tell me. <laughs> yeah, no, then you have to kind of go on your own. 
Um, some games like, uh, for instance, Morkborg, right? Morg. Which we haven't Morg. talked to it, it, about in length, but the modules for Morkborg, I don't know if I ever talked to you about this. That's one of the strong points of the modules in Morkborg uh, is when um, they present a scene to you. They are like their modules are on point really? with theming. Yeah. They go hard with describing a scene and really setting it up. Okay. Um, and there are some like specific modules and they're not even gigantic. We're talking about like zines. These are very small, yeah, yeah. They're like small, really, really small ones. There's one called, um, graves left wanting and the, the scenes that they set up in this one, which I haven't run for you guys yet. And I'm so hyped to run this one because the theming in this one is so on point and they don't have environments, right? So not really like this. Yeah. So I'm not getting environment stats. But tone and feel, they knock it out of the park. Awesome. Like they give you the tone and the feel. And when you're reading it, you feel like you're there. And they give you so much to give to your player. Uh, where you know, which sometimes you do see that in D D modules and stuff like that. And you see it in other games modules. Um, but a lot of times you don't. You get very basic stuff. So then you're kind of left to make it up on your own. Okay. And I I really am excited to see stuff like this. Uh, I think these environments are are awesome. I can't really find a negative about it. There isn't one that I can see. It's just another tool. Right. And if it's something that's not your cup of tea, you just Optional. don't use it. Exactly. Yeah. You just don't have to use it. You don't have to build environments if you think you can make it up on the fly. Right. And you can you know, doing environment justice just with your own skills as a game master. Mm -hmm. That's great. And it's completely up to you. I love it. But having another tool never against, and I think environments are going to be a lot of fun and I cannot wait to see what other ones we get on full release. I am so excited. Woo. So yeah, that was our, uh, our Ted talk on environments and equipment version yep. 1.3. Knocked out the E's real quick <laughs> and well, what level one domain cards next week. Yeah. Level one domain cards again. Well for yeah. us again, for us first for you first for you. Hopefully they don't release 1.4 before we do it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if they do, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll go over domain cards again. We'll do it for a third time. Yeah. We'll do it for a third time. Yeah. Uh, don't forget, roll with hope or just donate directly to the Critical Foundation. Yeah. If you don't want a, a cool t-shirt designed by Tyler Worthy that has a, a hope and fear die, which has looked super, super cool, uh, you can just donate directly. Uh, but if you want a cool shirt to wear yep. and also donate to Critical Role Foundation all through May, you said, right? All throughout the month of May. Exactly. Yep. yep. So for now. I've been Tyler. And I've been Richard. And we've been True, True Strike. Strike. Hello, adventures. My name's Tyler. And I'm Richard. On today's episode, we're going over Dagger Hearts level one domain cards. Again. <laughs> welcome to True Strike. Howdy, folks, and welcome back Howdy. to the show. Level one domain cards again. Yeah. We keep saying that again, and we reference that we're doing it again. Again um, for the first time. But it's again for, for some the first people. time. Yeah. Because we did this because we thought it would be really cool to go over all the domain cards. Yep. We recorded it, and then immediately they were all like, oh, but what if we did a revision? We were like, hey, Tyler's going to be on vacation. Let's record this real quick. It'll go up while he's gone. And then, hey, you need to come back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Things are going down. Yep, they made some changes, which is fine. Uh, that's totally. Okay. Yeah, totally that's great because uh, some of them needed changes, so sure. that's fine. So yeah, we did uh, originally record this, but we're re-recording it. And again, yep. what we're doing here is we're just going to be going through the level one domain cards. Absolutely. So these are the cards that you're choosing when you make your class. So when you're you know building your character, mm -hmm. you're getting to choose your domain cards that are essentially the abilities and spells that you have. For your character. You're building your character with your cards. That's really cool. Character. Yeah. Um, top of the show. Hey guys, it's still May. For the month of May, we have our Roll with Hope True Strike t-shirt. Any of these sold uh is a dollar donated to the Critical Role Foundation. If you would like to donate directly, please go to www.critroll.com slash foundation and you can give them all the money you wish. But back to the show. Yeah. So you want to start us off? No. So with the Arcana domain, <laughs> level one <laughs> cards, we're going to be looking at the spell. All these are going to be spell cards. It's the Unleash Chaos. At the beginning of a session, 
Place a number of tokens equal to your spellcast trait on this card. You can make a spellcast roll against a target within far range and spend any number of these tokens to channel raw energy from within yourself or unleash against them. Wait. And unleash against them. Aha! I got there! <laughs> it's like I'm doing this for the first time, but I'm not. <laughs> on a success, a roll a number of D10 equal to the tokens you spent and do that much damage to the target. Mark a stress to replenish this card with tokens up to your spellcast trait. Clear all tokens at the end of the session. Woo! I still love this one. Oh yeah, still great. To bring it out of your vault, which this was a big change in between the old version and this version, you used to oh, be able yeah. just bring cards out. Now this isn't an issue at like level one, right? Um, but once you're at the higher levels, level can, five. Yep, and you've actually and got above. more <laughs> cards, uh, you know, at your disposal than you can actually have in your and at a time, uh, you're going to have to pull some out of your vault if you if you need them on the fly. You used to be able to just pull them out uh, willy-nilly for free. Uh, well, well, not necessarily. Not some free. energy, but it wasn't an action or anything like that. Yeah. Now, not only is there a cost, which this one, for example, is uh, one. Oh, I'm forgetting what currency. It was stress. It's stress. Yes. Thank you. It's one stress to pull this out, but it's an action to do so. Yeah. Right. And that's the big trade-off. So before, it was just stress as your cost. Yep. Right? So you were just taking stress to be able to do something. Now it's actually taking an action to do so. So that's a pretty big change. Yes. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. But there's been some rebalancing and stuff here. So, yeah. One stress isn't isn't the end of the world to bring a card out. But the fact that you're using an action in the middle of combat, that's... Sure, it's an action to do it. And it's an action without a roll. So there's no chance of like rolling with fear or anything like that, yeah. but that's giving an action token to your GM. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's a trade off. And before, well, when we talked about this, we mentioned that, well, since you could do it whenever, could you do it? Oh, well, I'm ab about to get attacked or I'm doing this action and this other domain card would benefit me and it's zero or one even i'll just i'll just bring it out right in the middle of this action being performed yeah this now it's all in action that so that's just yeah, yeah that's not a thing that and this spell is just cool i love this one i like this a lot yep this is your eldritch blast yeah. i mean <laughs> the fact that you can just keep stacking on it with your um the spell cast trait right so yeah. you can just keep stacking and like you know send 3 d10 mm -hmm. across the board at somebody that's really really cool rad uh, next, we've got the Rune Ward. It is zero stress to bring this one out if you need to. Uh, with Rune Ward, you have a deeply personal token or trinket that can be infused with protective magic and held as a ward by you or an ally. Describe what it is and why it's important to you. When the holder of the ward takes damage, they can spend a hope to reduce it by 1d8. If the ward die rolls an 8, its power will temporarily end after it reduces damage this turn it can be recharged free on your next rest long rest short rest doesn't matter next rest i do like that if it's going to be expended it's expended on an eight because yeah. it's done the maximum amount of protecting it's done its job yeah and yeah. then it just comes back next rest yep this Love is this fun one. i like that you Very can give fun. it to a friend yeah I, I, it's Great. really really cool this is just a fun little ability mm -hmm. um and it kind of harkens back a little bit to the play test that we're doing in 5e right now with the witch where you have like the tokens that you can create to give to people. I'll say that so, have slight magic effect. This isn't the like one D and D 2024, you know, rendition of the player's handbook. This is worlds beyond number. Oh yeah. This 5e is, this play is test. crazy play test. Yeah. Yeah. From worlds beyond number, but it's the, the character rich is playing our Christmas yeah. drought home game is running this, witch uh homebrew. Yeah. And it has an ability. Like play I test. said, that's very similar to this, which is fun where you have like a, essentially a trinket that you can give somebody that they can use. Yeah. So it's kind of like a cool little thing that you can use to help your party members. I like it. I, yes, I'm always for stuff like this. And the, the little bit of role play of what is it? Like the card yeah. just asks, what is it? What does what it mean to it? you? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Last here for the level one arcana domain cards. We're looking at wall walk. It is one stress to pull this out of the vault. Spend a hope to allow a creature you can touch to climb on walls and ceilings as easily as walking on the ground below. This spell will end after 10 minutes or when you cast it on another creature. And yes, you can be that creature. Yes. Love it. Fun. I hmm. like it. 
Next thing we have here is the Blade Domain. Yes. So now we're out of spells and into abilities on this one. Uh, the first ability is Not Good Enough, and this one costs one stress to pull out of the vault if mm -hmm. you wanted to. And it's when you roll your damage dice, you may re-roll any ones or twos. If you do, you must take the new result even on a one or a two. This is cool. I like it. It's just like a uh, a do-over for your really low rolls, essentially. And it's it doesn't once it's in like once you have it, you you don't have to spend hope or anything to re-roll these dice. Yeah. So this is depending on your build, this might be a must take. Yo, yeah, this is really really good, and I would say a must take, but get pretty good going on too. Of course, of the course. last one. Uh, the next ability here is retaliation, mm -hmm. which again costs one stress, and this one is when you take damage from a creature in melee range. You may make a stress to immediately deal weapon damage to that creature at half proficiency rounded up. So this is just a quick retaliation strike, which is really, really good. I wouldn't say this is a must take right? Um, because at the end of the day, you're only doing um, weapon damage at half proficiency. Yep. So it's not a ton of damage, uh, but it is still kind of cool that no matter what, you're going to be doing something back. I'll say you're not rolling to hit. Yeah, you're not you rolling to hit. You're doing... just doing it back. So and it's if, not bad. If that could take out a creature, that could yeah, be fun. Yeah, if it could. Now, this next one, ooh, this one feels like a must-take for certain builds. And then it's zero. Ugh. So Whirlwind is a zero to take out of your vault. Mm -hmm. And when you make a successful attack using a weapon with melee or very close range, you may also spend a hope to use that roll against every other enemy in that weapon's range. Any additional enemies you succeed against this ability take half damage rounded up. This one is great. Yet again, maybe, maybe this, maybe there's a build you need this one for. You know, it's it's very good. It's right? very like, good. Yeah, we've know. seen this one in play in the one shot. Oh, and it's fantastic. And we saw it decimate small yeah. groups of little. This is this is good for hordes. Like, yeah. Oh God, any littles. That's a that's a really good one. I think whirlwind is my not good enough. Is good. I think Whirlwind is my must take on I this. I think not good enough is good enough. It's good. It's I, good enough. Uh, this see they're both in in this world of like, oh, you're you're getting better cards as you level up. Both of these seem like ones you could keep forever. Yeah. But no, and, they're and good forever. Where yeah. where not good enough shines to me is that one, like I said, you don't have to spend hope. You don't spend anything. And it will always be important. Yeah. Because it's always important, yeah. You roll a one, you're always going to want to re-roll that one. Mm -hmm. No, it's good. Next, we're looking at the bone domain. These are going to be abilities as well. First, death maneuvers. It's going to be zero to pull this one out of the vault. You can mark a stress to move anywhere within far range without making an agility roll to get there. I like it. That's cool. It just gets you yeah, there. Just gets you there. Yep. Next, we're looking at nimble. This is one stress to pull out. When? While this card is in your loadout, add half of your agility score to your evasion. Round it up. Woo! Talk about cards that just get out the beginning and keep forever. And then keep forever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's just a super duper passive card. Mm -hmm. And it is great. Yeah. This is a this is a must take card for specific builds. I, yes. 100%. <laughs> I, I don't know. I feel like if you you've. I don't know why you're using stress to, to pull this out. I just this should be no. Out. It should just be there. Yeah, this should just be. It out. could be a ten stress. <laughs> no, just, just, yeah, this should just, just be have out. it. This is good. Yeah, yeah, no. Uh, last for the bone domain, we're looking at. I see it coming. One stress to pull out when you are targeting, targeted by a ranged attack. Mark a stress to roll a d6 and increase your evasion against this attack by its value. I this one has super cool flavor. Yes, it does, and very good potential. Yes, like this these is are a, good cards. These, yeah, and Death Maneuvers is really good, but Nimble and I see it coming. Oh, I'm gonna have a real hard time choosing between those two. Like a real hard time choosing take them, between take those them both. two. Yeah, and that's take what it both. comes down to taking them both. Yeah, it's, <laughs> I, it's just it take them both. Yeah, I love it. They're they're two very cool cards. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so <sighs> far. My favorites on the list from what we've gone through. We've gone through quite a bit. <laughs> <laughs> the next thing we have is the Codex Domain. 
This yes. is where it gets super crazy. Yeah, I'm glad you get to read these. Yeah, because the codex domain is books. So these are actual codexes, and each one of these really like has these. three different options for what you can do. So you immediately go from the bone category, which is like literally one word ability cards, right? To full on three whole spells, three whole abilities, <laughs> three whole abilities per card yeah. in the codex domain. So we'll start it off with the book of Iliad. This costs two stress to pull out. Uh, all of them are going to cost two stress to pull there out. There we go. Uh, the three spells that you get with this one. Uh, first one is slumber. So make a spell cast roll against a very close target. Mm -hmm. On a success, they fall into a deep sleep until they take damage or the GM spends a fear to wake them. Mm -hmm. This is very cool. I like it. Um, it's better than every other sleep spell that I've ever seen in a TTRPG. Yeah. <laughs> you, you really, you're, you're really just rolling to hit them. Yeah. No, which is great. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Uh, the next one you have is Arcane Barrage. Uh, once per short rest, you use an action to spend any number of hope to shoot magic projectiles that automatically strike an enemy within close range. Roll a d6 equal to the hope you spent and deal that much direct magic damage. In another game, this would be called Magic Missile. Yes, but it's not. It's Arcane Barrage. Ah, legally distinct. <laughs> <laughs> I Arguably, I like it better. Is that because it's d6? It's D6, and I the way that you can gain hope, you could shoot a lot of these things. Uh, it's just really cool. I like it a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, the last ability we have for Book of Iliad is Telepathy. Uh, you open a line of uh, mental communication with one target you can see. This communication connection lasts until you use the spell to connect with another creature. This one is really interesting because, because I can connect with you and then walk to the other side of the friggin' world and yeah, we're still connected. <laughs> the, the line doesn't end. Right. Uh, I don't know if they're going to keep this because it seems a little bit OP without right it now breaking. without yeah. it breaking uh, because there really is the only thing that stops this as far as we can see here is you using the, um, you know, connect someone else to connect to somebody else. So this seems like it's going to have to get changed because it seems like minutes it's distance, unintended. something. Yeah, distance, you know, probably not line of sight. They're right? on their second really very, you know, version, though. They didn't fix it yet. They didn't fix it yet. Change I think it, they're yeah. going to. Um, so, yeah, I, that's. How do you feel about Arcane Barrage uh, being once per short rest? I like it. You think it'd just be a one and done, like, nuke? Yeah. It's yeah. pretty good. Yeah, okay. I like it. I think it's good with it. The next one we have is the uh, Book of Tafar. Again, two to pull out and stress. The first ability is Wild Flame. Make a specialist uh, or sorry, make a spell cast roll against up to three enemies in melee range to you. A flame erupts from your hand, dealing 2d6 magic damage and a stress to any you succeed against. That's cool. Mm -hmm. Damage and stress onto a target. Real good. Love especially it. with stress being as important as it is. Yeah. Next make thing them vulnerable. We, next thing we have is Mage Hand. Never heard that one before. Not legally distinct. <laughs> it's just the same thing. You can reach out with it a magical hand, the same size and strength as your own to anywhere within range from you. So the same, but better. I was going to say, I say the same thing, but it's better. Yeah, it's better. It's so you much can better. finally actually carry yeah, your mage hand you is actually going to, to do something yeah. real. Yeah. It's yeah, no it's, longer just pulling down levers. <laughs> yeah, no, you can actually do some really cool stuff with mage. You can hand carry now. the groceries. <laughs> Ooh, right. That's good. I like that. I need a mage hand. <laughs> Last thing we have on here is Mysterious Mist. You Ooh. use an action to spend uh, a hope to cast a temporary thick fog that encircles a stationary area up to very close range to your current location. Everyone within is hidden to anybody outside the fog. My mind pictured this as like the, the, the board game of Mousetrap. Where like, I'm spending an action and the action spends a hope. And then... <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, it's the Rube Goldberg <laughs> machine of actions. <laughs> so that's it for the Book of Tafar. Mm -hmm. And the last book we have is the Book of Ava. First ability for the Book of Ava. Well, actually, I should say, again, uh, two stress. Uh, so the first thing is Power Push. Make a spell cast roll against the target in melee range. On a success, they are blasted back to a far range and take uh, 1d10 magic damage using your proficiency. From melee to far. From melee to far. Woo! That's just pushing them. Yeah. Yeeting them back. That's awesome. Next thing we have is Tava's armor. Use an action to spend a hope that gives your target you can touch plus one d6 to their armor score uh, at the next time they mark an armor slot. You can't stack Tava's armor on one creature. So it's just a one d6. You can't just like tap, 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 right, right, right. and keep stacking it, which kind of makes me sad. 
Because it would it be been really cool if you could. Yeah. No, nah, I mean, max it out at two. Give me two taps. <laughs> Give me two taps. Double That's tap. all I'm asking for. Double tap. Next thing we have, and the last thing we have, is ice spikes. So make a spell cast roll to summon a large ice spikes within very far range. You use them as a weapon. On a success, they deal 1d6 physical damage using your proficiency. So not bad. I love this grimoire. This card specifically. This card specifically. Uh huh. Okay. Ice spikes with the uh, blah 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 blah. Summon large ice spikes within very large range. Use them as a weapon. University. That's so fun. The armor you can put on multiple people. Yeah. And then power push. So I can see you power pushing and then ice spiking somebody. That's really cool. Why would you not? I mean, if 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 basically, oh oh dang, they're in melee range. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Oh, dang, they're in melee range. Bye. Bye. Yeah. No. There's no limit. Yeah. You just, I mean, sh- sure, you got to hit them with a spellcast roll. But if they're in my grill, this is my go-to. This is your go-to. Yeah. Because there's no, like, save. Like, they're True. and they're going to a far range. This, this is very easily off a cliff, into a chasm, fiery doom. We do know how well off a cliff works. We've seen this. <laughs> like, <laughs> we've avoided entire encounters with a Yeti just by yeeting him off a cliff. Yeah. Yeah. This is inc- I I don't know how there's not a limit on this. Yeah. Or I like hope it. Or anything. I am. Uh, I, and I, it's D10. I do like Book of Ava. Look at I'm, your weapons. I'm not taking it. I'm taking Book of Tafar. It's the one I didn't think you were going to take. That's funny. No. the book the of, other two were better. No. Really? I don't, Okay. So uh-huh. Slumber, Arcane Barrage, and Telepathy. Telepathy's broken. They're going to fix that. And Arcane Barrage is awesome. And Arcane Barrage is awesome. Slumber is good. But I mean, the Book of Tafar, you have not burning hands. <laughs> Wild Flame. Right. Wild Flame that does 2d6 magic mm-hmm. plus stress. Mm-hmm. That's hardcore. I love that. Mm-hmm. You have upgraded Mage Hand, which I love. You're gonna, yeah, you're I'm gonna take that, that mage hand because I'm gonna use that to do all kinds of wacky stuff. You're right, right. There are so many zany scenarios in which mage hand is now usable and better. So many scenarios where an extra hand can help you out. Yeah. And Mysterious Mist, which I love because it hides everybody. Do you? So, Book of Tafar is the card for Codex Domain for me. As much as I like your pushing around, your playing Jedi, all three feels like the weakest to me. I think Book of Tafar is the strongest card for my play style. <laughs> Let us know in the comments if you think Book of Tafar is the strongest of all three of these. So yeah, I'm hype about Book of Tafar. But okay. overall, this is very interesting because we've gone away from single abilities to now with these codexes, you have options. Mm-hmm. And it kind of represents the whole like, I have a spell book thing. Totally. Yeah, right. Which is really cool. Instead of I have a spell you have a spell book. And there's not spell slots. I mean, yeah. sure, you've got like, oh, one's per short rest. Okay, that's borderline a spell slot. Sure. But power push. Power push. Boom, boom, boom. You're going back to the power push. It's so good. It's too good. A D10? And you push him? It's all right. It's so good. All right. Over here at the grace domain, though, we're looking at some spells until we get to an ability. But first off, we're looking at spell in rapture. This one's zero to pull out of your vault. Make a spell cast roll against a close target. On a success, you can temporarily keep their attention on you, narrowing their field of view and drowning out any sound but your voice. You may also mark a stress on a success to deal two stress to the target. I know you like that because you like dealing stress. Yes. <laughs> this is cool. The fact that it's a zero to pull out yeah. is really interesting. And I just love that, like, if you if you do this, you're you're getting it. But then just like the, the last sentence, you may also mark a stress to deal to stress. Do stress. So it's all like, uh-huh. oh, this is cool. It's working. Also, I'm going to take a stress and deal to stress. And that's completely optional. You don't have to do 100%. that part of it. Yeah. And I think that's just really neat. And you were just aggroing. <laughs> aggroing one thing. Yeah. Yep. Uh, next spell we're looking at inspirational words. One stress to pull this out of your vault. You can imbue your speech with enhancing power. 
At the beginning of a session, place a number of tokens on this card equal to your present score. When you recite your words, spend a token and choose an option from the list below to grant through the ally you are speaking to. If the action tracker is active, place that token on it. At the end of a session, clear all tokens. You can either clear a stress, heal a hit point, or gain a hope. This is cool. I think these are good. I would never do the last one. Unless needed. I was going to say. I mean, if gain you have a hope, no stress and everybody's healed. That, okay. Fair enough. Gaining a hope is really good. And that's the thing is that like you're, are you just looking at this only in combat? No, out of combat too. That's what I mean. But like, you've, as you know, a hope machine, like I can see you using this to gain hope. If you really need it though, because you're talking at the beginning of a session, you're stacking this up, right? Yeah. Which means you're not going to be getting more of it until the start of your next session. Yes. And what has a decent chance of happening at some point during your session? Not necessarily combat. Gaining stress or doesn't you gain stress for all kinds of things. Well, yeah, you gain stress for all kinds you of things. You have a bad yeah. dinner. You gain stress in this game. <laughs> Yeah, true. I don't know. I like it. I think it's got a good gaining versatility hope, Gaining to hope, it. I could see the use. Of, oh, I need hope to do this thing. Boom, here's a hope. Yeah. However, it's my new word. I'm sorry. I know it's I'll wrong. Remember. Um, <laughs> I always forget we're on a podcast. I can't say these <laughs> stupid words without no explanation. <laughs> uh, <laughs> gaining hope it's is something you can do <laughs> easily. Yes. You're just like, hey, Jim, can I like check out this thing and like i don't know whatever roll for it ha ha i rolled with hope i rolled Bing! with hope <laughs> got it all right cool now we're good okay fair fair but okay last one here uh deft receiver this one is an ability not a spell Def deceiver oh god i need to sleep <laughs> Deft receiver deceiver there we go it is zero stress to pull this one out of your vault Spend a hope to take advantage on a roll you make to deceive or trick someone into believing a lie you tell them. That's fun. Yeah. Yeah. It's. I'm interested to see what you're about to say because part of me knows this is weak compared to some of the other stuff, right? Yes. But also, I know you love social abilities. I love social abilities, but at the end of the day... It's just advantage. Yes. With just a hope. So you're just spending a hope to take advantage. Advantage is better now. Somebody. Which is, yeah, advantage is better now. Um, but it is, I think it's the weakest of the three. I'm not necessarily saying too. it's a bad thing, but it definitely does kind of stick out as being kind of weak since it's only just a hope for advantage. We're back to like the, what kind of character are you building? Yeah. I'm glad it's here. Oh yeah, no. To choose it. No, no doubt. I'm glad it's here, and I think it fits in really well with the kits that can take advantage of it, right? Yep. So you're going to have these really cool, sweet talking bard builds that are only going to benefit from this. Mm -hmm. um, so I do like it. It's a good ability. I just don't know if I like it in practice yet. Ooh, you get to read some of the good ones. Oh yeah, now we're getting into the uh, midnight domain. Yep, roguey type stuff. So in the Midnight Domain, we have Uncanny Disguise, which costs zero stress to pull out. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a spell. When you have a few minutes to prepare, you can mark a stress to don the facade of any humanoid you can picture clearly in your mind. While disguised, all presence rolls to avoid scrutiny have advantage, and the spell will begin to fade after one hour. So this is just a really cool disguise self. Mm -hmm. uh, but I like the fact that it's anybody that you can picture like clearly in your mind. Right. So this is going to be something that you've seen or... Uh, I guess you can use that to be open to interpretation because you not necessarily have to have seen somebody to envision them clearly in your Gosh, mind. Gosh, could you imagine? You're like a rough approximation. Oh, yeah, <laughs> just close enough, but odd. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like I did no no, no um, oh gosh what is it the mole was on the left the cheek. mole yeah <laughs> from Robin Hood Men in Tights <laughs> where his mole just keeps moving around throughout the entire movie uh. I love that <laughs> I'm totally using that no this is just really cool I like it um, but I do like uh, the fact that it's a zero stress to bring out um, because action is really isn't going to matter on this one I don't think mm -hmm. because of the fact that you know you're not going to be like in the middle of a battle. <laughs> And you're going to be all like, give me a couple minutes underneath this table yeah. and I'm going to come out with the mole on the left cheek instead of the right cheek. Um, so it doesn't really matter. And then it, the fact that it's zero stress is really cool. Mm -hmm. 
Next thing we have here is the Reign of Blades. Uh, Reign of Blades! This one costs one stress to use. You spend two hope to conjure throwing blades that strike enemies very close to you. Make a spell cast roll, and all targets that you succeed against take D8 magic damage using your proficiency. Mm -hmm. If any targets uh, you hit are currently vulnerable, they take an additional 1D8 magic damage. Right. And that was one stress to pull out of your vault, not one stress to use. Yes, one stress to pull out of your Mm -hmm. vault. Sorry. No, you're good. And that's a big thing, and we've kind of glossed over a little bit, but, you know, we've we've gone over previous episodes. You can switch these out at long rest for free. For free. So the only time you're, and we keep bringing them up because it's part of the card. The only time you have to pay the stress to pull these out of your vault is if you need it or want it in the middle of your adventuring day. And you day. don't have it in your right. kit for the adventuring day, yep. basically. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So This yeah. one's sick. This one's really cool. I like it. Yeah. Two hope. Two hope, so which is a little bit pricey, yep. but it's a pretty decent amount of damage, especially if you have a vulnerable target. Very close is what, like 10 feet-ish? Yeah. And then you've got, you know, it's all targets within that range. Pretty good. Yeah. And the Pretty vulnerable good. thing, this uh-huh. is a really good buddy move. Right. Yeah. Because Especially because have... so many things now are focusing on bringing up the stress. Yeah, exactly. Make yeah. You're vulnerable. bringing up the stress, making them vulnerable. You have your other party members that are, uh, you know, going to be participating in that. So this is very roguish, like sneaking up in and yeah. then using that to your advantage to deal extra damage. Really cool. The last card we have is pick and pull. Mm-hmm. And this one is a zero stress to bring out of your vault. Mm-hmm. Uh, you have advantage on any attempt to pick any non-magical lock, disarm any trap, or steal any item from a target, uh, either through self or by force. How so, rogue is your rogue? This is just fun. I like it. Are um, you are you a thief? Yeah. Take this. Yep. Yeah, if you're really going to lean into... Yeah, that's the how rogue is your rogue. If you're leaning into damage rogues, maybe this doesn't care. Right. Maybe you don't care about are this. Are you espionage social rogue? Go then, with your own candy disguise. Yeah, exactly. If you want to be disarming all the traps, you're going to be the picking lead. Pockets, picking you're picking locks. pockets, stealing stuff from people, yeah. making sure that there's no traps, unlocking all the doors. You're going to want to go pick and pull. Mm-hmm. But, and I, I appreciate that they say that they actually point this out of steal an item from a target either through stealth or, or by, by force. force. Yeah. So if it's not going to go sneaky, sneaky, and you're going to shoulder check someone and grab something out of their arms... You still got advantage. I could have used this in five. E. <laughs> this is yeah. There's there's a, there's enough vagueness here. You can really work with this. All right. Uh, over to Sage Domain. We're looking at your druids and such. Uh, the first one is a spell. It's vicious entangle. One stress to pull out of your vault. You make a spell cast roll against a target within far range. One a success. <laughs> they got to fix these spellings. They got to fix these spellings. Oh, it says one. one I a promise. Success. One a success. <laughs> I almost corrected you. but like, ah, it's not his fault. <laughs> not this time. This is this one I get. So let me correct it for them. On a success, roots and vines reach out from the ground and temporarily restrain them, dealing 1d8 physical damage. On a success, this one they got, you may also spend hope to temporarily restrain any enemies very close to your target. That one's cool too. Yeah. Because I like that you grab them and then anyone within very close to them, it chains. Yeah. <laughs> and they're it all, just kind of chains out. In. Yeah. Yep. It grows out from them. They don't take the damage, but they're restrained. Yeah. You can still restrain Same. them. All right. These next two are abilities, not spells. So this one, Gifted Tracker. Zero stress to pull out of your vault. You make a spell cast roll to track or ask the GM one question you'd be able to learn about a specific creature or group of creatures based on signs of their passage. If you spend a hope before the roll, you can double your spell cast trait as the modifier. If you encounter any creatures you've tracked, uh, your evasion against them is plus two. I love the benefit of the bonus evasion. Mm-hmm. Awesome. It's always interesting to be able to be like, yo, GM. Yeah. Tell me <laughs> something. Don't, don't, what do I know? I'm going yeah. I like that. Being like specifically, like, yeah, you. I'm like I need to know something about what, what I'm what, tracking. What here. can what I pick can you, up? Yeah, what can I pick up from this? Yeah, if I taste the droppings, <laughs> what do I? Can, <laughs> what what can I taste tell? like? That's oh god, I'd be the worst. Um, what what do I know about them? Well, from the droppings you've just tasted, <laughs> you can <laughs> like, tell they've had. No, that's not what I meant. <laughs> they've eaten fresh uh, skulk. You asked. You did it. <laughs> you did this to you, you not me. <laughs> you, you rolled for this. 
<laughs> uh, Roll for poop taste. <laughs> Next uh, ability, we're looking at Nature's Tongue, Zero Stress Bloody Revolt. You can speak the language of the hidden, natural world. When you want to speak to the plants and animals around you, make an instinct roll. Uh, you're looking for a 12 here. On a success, they'll give you the information they know. With fear, their knowledge might be limited or come at a cost. In addition, whenever you make a spellcast roll while within a natural environment, you may spend a hope before the roll to add plus one to the result. This is my favorite card. Is it? I love it. Because I'm going to make you be a mushroom. <laughs> <laughs> I'm 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 surprised it's only a plus one when you're you're throwing some hope on there. Yeah, no, I like it. I I just like the idea that again, it's this is a um. So the sage domain is going to be your rangers and your druids. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, I I really I I like the the talking to plants around you aspect of, of this. Of course, right. I like this being oh, so in touch with nature. Me. Like I said, I'm going to make you be a mushroom. Oh. <laughs> I don't know, I'm going to look for like the tiniest plant. And then I'm gonna be like, I want to talk to that specifically that plant oh, right me. there. <laughs> because it's funny. Cause you all have, you already, I know you have a preconceived notion of what a plant sounds like. Like if you're talking to like a giant sequoia, Oh. Exactly. I already knew what the voice was going to be, and so did you. You knew what the sequoia sounds like. It's always like the same. Versus the tiny little sh- shallot. Ah. <laughs> like, you know what they're going to sound like. But uh, just overplayed. I like it. I'm, old, I'm washed up. I like the, uh, the, I just like the idea of being able to talk to the natural world sure. and get information as like your thing. I like this better than tracking. Like, because I think tracking is cool, but I think these are just way too different roads for theming. Because one of them is all like, oh, yeah, I'm really good at like looking at like footprints and tasting poop. And the other one is all like, nah, I'm just going to talk to this tree and see what this tree says about where they went. Yo, Bark, where'd he go? Yeah, like, where'd he go? Me. Or the grass. And be like, man, those guys were really rude. They stomped all over me. <laughs> I was having a really good day and then this like, a whole army marched right over me. I had a whole family. They're gone. They're decimated by that wheel track from that cart. I love it. Headed northwest. Fun. I've heard from my neighbors down the road. They turned east. That's so much better than tasting poop. Sure. Yeah. I don't disagree. Uh, moving over. Wait. I did the last one. Yeah, you did. It's your turn. <laughs> I was just talking a lot. I know. <laughs> All right. So now we have the Splendor Domain. Uh, the first card we have here is a spell, and this is Bolt Beacon, which costs one stress to pull out your vault. Make a spell cast roll against a target within far range. On a success, spend a hope to send a bolt of shimmering light towards them. Treat it like a ranged weapon, dealing 1d8 magic damage using your proficiency that makes them glow brightly and become temporarily vulnerable. So again, this is one of those buddy spells where yep. you're setting up your rogue to do your reign of blades. So this is really cool. Uh, I like it. Um, it's got decent range um, and it's only a hope, which is really, really cool. You're so, just weaponizing your hope. Yeah. Weaponizing your hope and not only dealing damage, but that vulnerable condition. That's that's huge. I love it. The next thing we have here is mending touch. This one costs again one stress to pull out of your vault. You lay your hands upon a creature and channel healing magic to help close their wounds. When you could take a few minutes to focus on that person you're helping, spend two hope and heal two points of stress. Mm -hmm. Uh, Or, no, sorry, send two hope and heal a hit point or a stress. So you uh, take a little bit of time to do a little bit more. Once per long rest, when you spend this healing time learning something new about them or revealing something about yourself, the two hope that you spend heals two hit points or two stress instead. This one is awesome. Must take. Because of one, obviously, this is really super. You're either healing a hit point or stress for two hope. Yep. That's a good trade-off. So hit point, massive. Stress can be massive. But the very fact that once per long rest, you can do a little bit of extra role-playing. Yep. To deal, not deal, but to get do better. more. <laughs> right? So you're still spending two hope. Yeah. But now you're healing two hit points or removing two stress. The healing two hit points is huge. Mechanically rewarded. Mechanically. For 
role playing. For role playing, and I love that. You're playing the game the way they want you to play the game, and yes. they reward you for doing so. Yeah. The only thing it's that like I spent, it's he's like Spencer Stark sitting in the room with you, like yeah. yeah. The only thing go. I don't like about this mm-hmm. is that you can only do that once per log rest. You want to just keep doing it? I'm gonna. Yeah, that's fair enough. Tell me something about yourself. Yeah. Why you already don't you get already the bonus. did it? Like don't don't dodge the question. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want the healing? Because <laughs> I'll just stop healing you all together. If you don't want to talk to me. Well, no. uh, one thing about Bolt Beacon, um, it's interesting that they you you don't sp- you don't burn the hope until you find out if you've missed. Right. Let's see here. Um, on a success. Oh, you're right. Yep. Yeah, I glossed over that. Yeah, that's interesting. So. It's it's one thing. It's like okay, you get no benefit at all if you have no hope, right? Like if you roll a hit, you hit, and then you're like, "crap, I'm out of hope." Nothing happens. Yeah, there's no nothing happens. Minor yeah. benefit. But on the flip side, you're only if you're only casting this because you know you have the hope. You don't burn the hope if you miss. Yeah, that's not bad. I mean, that's that's very interesting, and that's a really good point. Like I said, that I glossed over on that one. So yeah, you you make your spell cast roll as long as you have the hope then you know you're at least not just wasting it yeah. but again if you're not paying attention you don't have the hope and you hit and then you go to burn it and you got nothing you got nothing because that was a wasted action <laughs> yep yeah uh last spell we have on here is reassurance uh this one costs zero to unvault once per short rest after an ally attempts an action roll but before the consequences take place you may offer assistance or words of support when you do, they may re-roll their dice. They must accept uh, the results of this new roll. Uh, I like this one. This one is really, really cool because it, it happens after you attempt the roll. Mm-hmm. So this is not like you trying to like, oh, like discussing whether or not you're going to help somebody before they make the roll. You know what I mean? It feels more organic when it's after the roll has already happened. I agree. And that way it's like, you know, okay, so you're... You know, the consequences haven't happened yet. You missed it by just a little bit, um, you know, or just even entirely, actually, because you're re-rolling. Yeah. Um, just take the new result. Yeah, now. you can re-roll their dice. I like the fact that you can uh, re-roll all the dice. So it's not just like, you know, the hope die or the fear right. die or something like that. The fact that you just re-roll them all is really cool. It'd probably be too good, but I wish it was once per ally. Ooh, I think that would probably be... Uh, I don't it's know. Too good. That's that's too good. I think. Yeah. But I'm. I do worry. Players are just gonna get the FOMO, and oh, they're gonna be and like, not "I'm never it? gonna use it." Sorry, I'm holding out for a bigger moment. Yeah, I guess I can totally see that. Yeah, but I I guess it really just depends on how organically short rests are gonna be applied. That's into what the, I was gonna say. The game that you're playing. And what kind right? of GM do you have? And yeah, because if you have a GM that is really like pushing you hard to not take short rests right right then fomo is definitely going to be a thing because then you're going to be worried about like wasting it yeah on something we stupid. need it for the big moment yeah because it's like well if i use it now who knows what's going to happen you know an hour on the session but then 10 minutes later the session is over <laughs> or 10 minutes later you're short resting yeah and you didn't use it at all so i i can definitely see the that there's a bit of a, a trap there as far as the FOMO is considered. Mm-hmm. But I think that it would probably be too powerful if you if you had it once per... What if it just ate a bunch of hope? Three hope, Ooh, four hope. I think I would prefer that more. Like, honestly, I think that if you... Because you're hopeful yeah. that they'll, that your ally is going to nail it, it, right? Yeah, I think that this would actually... I think that's a really good fix for this. I think that if you remove the once per short rest... And you give it a hope cost. Mm -hmm. It gives you another thing that you can spend hope on, which is kind of the theme for the Splendor Domain anyway, Mm -hmm. right? Because Beacon of Hope costs uh, a hope to use. And then Mending Touch costs two hope to use. So is two hope too expensive for reassurance? Two? Yeah. I'd say three. Oh, you think three? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a big deal. No, it is a big deal because you're re-rolling all your dice. Uh Yeah. And you're, you're... you're obviously they're trying to balance it with the once per short rest. Mm -hmm. So make it expensive. (sighs) Yeah. And it's action roll period. Yep. Which is a huge umbrella. So I, yeah, I think you're right. I think you would have to make it significantly more. I think that's a really good uh, change to this. That would probably benefit it. You're onto something there. All right. (gasps) Oh no, everything went away. (laughs) 
<laughs> Hold on. All right. Uh, no, we're fine. No, we're fine. Everything's fine. <laughs> Valor domain. <laughs> These are all going to be abilities. Uh, first, we're looking at forceful push. Zero stress to pull out. It is going to be wet when you make a successful melee attack. You can push the target out of melee range and spend a hope to make them temporarily vulnerable. On a success with hope, add an additional 1d6 to your damage dice on this attack. Hmm. Question. Shoot. How far out of melee range am I pushing them? Just. Just a close? Yeah, just you sure? Close. Doesn't say so. Maybe yeah. I'll push them very far. No, because it says you're pushing them out of melee range. Yeah. So as soon as and they're into, out of melee range. Into very far. No, I get they're it. They're out. Know. Yeah. I want more specifics or I'm going to try to break this game. I think that it doesn't need to be that. I think it's good as it already It's really is. good. It this is. is really good. No. I it, like this a lot. Because you're, get, you're getting the push. You're right? getting the push. Yeah. And the, it, you're not spending anything for that. Right? What? When no, you make yeah. a successful so, melee no, attack, you're not for that. You can you push can them. spend the hope to make them vulnerable. Right. The push is free. Right. And you can do that every attack. Yeah. The push is forever. Free. <laughs> so that's really good. No, you're spending yep. the hope to make them vulnerable, which, which is really good awesome. too, because again, we're getting into that whole buddy cop now you've thing. You got advantage on them. And oh, yeah, man. so you're setting up your your teammates for success here, mm -hmm. which is really good. And on a success with a hope, just additional one D six extra D six. Yeah. Woo! Overall, this is a really strong ability. That's great. I like it. And I think if you were yeeting them very far, it'd probably be pretty broken. I mean, obviously that's why I'm <laughs> trying to do it. <laughs> Stop it. Next ability, we're looking at I am your shield. This is one stress to pull out of your vault. When an ally very close to you is going to take damage, you may mark a stress to stand in its way and take the damage instead. Reduce the damage by a value equal to your strength trait. You may also reduce the damage by spending armor slots. This one is fan friggin -tastic. Yep, this is one of the cards that I took with... Uh... Rivet bottom mm -hmm. because it is so good, mm -hmm. like so good thematically and just in abilities. Period. Very close. Yeah, not melee. We're talking tennis feet. Mm -hmm. Stress. You just get in front, and you're going to take less damage than they were going to take, regardless, because it's being decreased by your strength out the jump. Yeah. But then if that's not enough, sure, armor, armor, you know, got brought down a bit. Huh. But you're you're bringing that down your armor slots also, which you can spend yeah. more of if you need to. And thematically, it's just so yeah. good. Thematically, like I don't see like even with the armor debuff, I'm still with Rivet uh, going to take this ability because I'm it's using so a shield already. Yeah. So even with the debuff to armor, the shield is still doing yep. work. The you know the the um the the reduce the damage by your strength trait is still doing work. And it's still doing what it intends to do, which is you helping to protect your squishy teammates. It's awesome. Um, really good card. Yep. I like it. I agree. Last over here for the Valor Domain and the last of our domain cards we're talking about today. We've got Bare Bones. This ability card cost one, sorry, zero. God, I don't even know why I said one zero is what I was going to say. Zero stress to pull out of your vault. Uh, while this card is in your loadout, just in your loadout, if you choose not to equip armor, you have an armor score equal to three plus your level. That's interesting because as you level, it gets better. Gets better and better. Yeah. So this is the de facto monk build. I'm card. naked. Right. So here's the other thing, right? With our, this is even better now that I think about it. Oh man! Uh huh. Yeah. Uh huh. We already took away those two, papers. Three, but it's two, three, four, four five. and five. Right. Oof. Yeah. This, this card has greater at implications level one now. Is a four. Yeah. A four. It is equal to the second best armor in the game now. Yes. Starting. Starting, starting with equipment. no negatives. Yeah, I didn't even think about that. Yeah, no, it's this has greater implications awesome. with the armor changes. Yeah, this is a really good card. And man, monks. That's cool. I forget. Does having does having a shield count as having armor? Mm. So the shields are not listed under armor. Those are listed under secondary uh basically equipment, right? So instead of taking a secondary weapon, you're using that. 
I don't know rules as written if shields are considered armor. Right. So that is something we must we'll have to. Hey, Theron. <laughs> we'll have to dive into. <laughs> Fact um, check us. No. If it is not. Yeah. Wow. Right. <laughs> right. If it is not. You're, you're borderline wow. naked and you got a shield. And, and a shield. Oh, yeah. This is like full on like barbarian look. Right. You got like you know, your little uh, loincloth and a shield, right? some leather straps, but somehow out tanking the guy uh-huh. <laughs> that's like got a whole helmet on. And, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because they're just walking ahead and going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. God, he's ah through the soft bits, like <laughs> through the rivets, and you're just pink, and the sword's like curved. <laughs> yeah, no, this is that's that's really good observation. Um, but yeah, a solid card that is pretty much going to be the de facto choice if you're doing like every the level monk your build. armor's improving. And then every level your armor's going like up. Thirteen. That's cool. At at high, you know max level or whatever. For you, just your your muscles getting stonkier. Like yeah. <laughs> Oh, that's so cool to me. Yep. So those are all of our level one domain cards. Um, and now I'm going to ask you a question. Oh. Um, and uh, I have not going to give you any time to prep for this. Um, but I am going to answer my own question just to give you a couple of minutes to make your decision. Um, because I already know my answer to this question. And you might There's so much tension. What is this? And you, you might already know this. You patient. might already know this without any thinking at all. Um, but I'm going to ask you out of all the level one domain cards, what's uh-huh. your MVP? Your favorite card card one duh. card out of the entire list, which is why I said, I'm going to give you a second to find yours. Yeah. Because, because I've got a couple. I know mine already. Mm-hmm. So I already have gone through this list and I know my card. And it's actually one that we just did only two cards ago. Mm-hmm. And that is I am your shield. So out of all the cards in the level one domain card, I am your shield, which is the valor domain, which we just covered, uh, is my favorite. So this one is the one that costs the one stress to pull it out of your vault. And again, we'll reiterate this one. Uh, when an ally very close to you is going to take damage, you may mark a stress to stand in its way and take the damage instead. Reduce the damage by a value equal to your strength mm-hmm. trait. You may also reduce the damage by spending uh, more armor slots. Um, This is my favorite card in the lot just because it is a very simple, strong. Mm -hmm. So keep it simple, keep it stupid, keep it strong. Keep it stupid. Yeah. And this one is great because it is just doing what that specific class really like that specific type of build that I have in mind is going to excel at, which is taking that damage and protecting your allies in the best way that you know how, right? Which is by jumping forward and taking that damage yourself and built right. This is going to be a super fun thing to do. And it just thematically, I think is going to look really awesome jumping around the battlefield and just trying to take all the hits and not necessarily looking healthier for it. Right. right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And probably depending on somebody to help you up. But at the end of the day, running around the battle and just tanking all these hits and just jumping in front of your friends and everything like that. Mm-hmm. Out of all the cards and all the different builds that I have in mind, this is one of my favorite cards. Uh, and it's why it's one of the ones that was a must take for my my new character that I built. So, yeah, that's my MVP card. If I had to choose one card out of all the level one domain cards. So I'm going to let you my, my train of thought now. First, I went back to not, not good enough, which you hated. But that's the one where if you roll a one or two, you can reroll it, take the new result because I, I truly do think it's good forever. Then I'm like, okay, you've got nimble though, where if it's in your loadout, add half of your agility score to your evasion. And who cares? The armor is, if you're not getting hit, you're not getting hit. Your evasion score is huge. Then, though, I go to the Book of Ava with that power push, right? Like, it's stupid good. It's so good. Just willy-nilly, like, D10, D10, get out of here. Pushing him back, pushing him back. Plus, you got the armor and the ice spikes on top of that. Like you mentioned, push him back, ice spikes. You've got a combo built in. And after all of this, ending touch with its bonus to the role play for that healing. And I still settle on bare bones being my favorite. <laughs> All of that and bare bones is still your favorite. 
because of the state of armor, starting armor. Oh, specifically right now. You, this one card, this one domain card choice at the beginning of the game sets you up better for armor score. I, I wanted to build so your first character to be like a walking tank, right? Yeah. I wanted the 13 AC as my first. I didn't care if I was getting hit. I wanted to dump armor slots into combat. This is borderline my best chance of getting there now. <laughs> So you're you're advocating for bare bones to not just be a monk build card. You're just, this is just this is my Conan. This card. is just yeah. Like so you're you're advocating for this to be any class that can take this card is better than having armor. Period. I think so. Okay. Okay. Yeah, because it's not it's not your strength or any. Uh, the only thing you have to worry about is what, what level is your character. Yeah. What level right? your character is, and yeah. then you never have to worry about armor. For the rest of time. Well, so because every level your armor improves. Yeah. But I think that the only argument against that would be, we don't know what higher tier magical armor mm-hmm. looks like yet. And then swap that card out. That's true. But it's going to get you there. But then it, it gets you there. It gets you there. And for then sure. you just vault it forever. And it's not a class feature. Or until you using. get like, you know, arrested and they take all your armor and you're all like, Haha, I'm still tough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Didn't even need it. <laughs> Why have you even been wearing armor? Yeah. <laughs> or like somebody breaks in on you, you're sleeping. Doesn't I, matter. I do love the like the idea that you're just restrained by the armor and it's making you weaker. Yeah, it's just making you weaker. And then the weaker, armor yeah. is busted and broken. You've used it and you're just like shed it and you're just <laughs> Yep. Why <laughs> have you always been doing this? <laughs> like arrows are tink tink. I think it's funny that we both settled on a Valor domain card. As that our says a MVP lot about Valor, though. In level one, yeah, Valor is is strong. I mean, because you, we, so we picked I am your shield, and we picked bare bones, which leaves forceful push, right? Which again is another one of those abilities that just fantastic is fantastic. Yeah. It works. Valor is a very strong set of cards. Mm-hmm. Um, great and, domain. Yeah, is a really really Wonderful domain. great domain that doesn't really seem weak or have a weak point. Whereas some of the other ones, you know, you have a card that's in each one almost. Yeah. That could use some work. I um, I really did think that you were going to go back to Book of Ava, though. Did um, you? Yeah. I well, was I was very, very close. When you look at the the Codex domains, yeah. it's it, it's almost hard to not put them above other cards because, because they're you get so three, versatile. Basically three cards. You're getting in one three card. cards in one card yeah. almost. Yeah. So it's kind of hard to skip over those. Um, but yeah, I think it's uh, very telling that uh, I, I think that I am confident in saying that out of all the domains, Valor is the only one that has I that I really have a strong argument for every single card in that domain at level one. Whereas all the other domains, there's at least one card in it that's just not for sure great. Right. Whereas Valor, that's tough. Man. Oh, it's so good. Valor is tough to look at all three of those cards and have to make a choice. And that's the thing about uh, uh, bare bones. Bare bones could be useless to you. Yeah. You might not that that doesn't matter to you. You don't need the three plus, you know, what you want you wanna wear armor, whatever reasons, whatever else. That card might be nothing. Mm-hmm. But how I want to build my character, that's awesome. awesome. That's a top pick for me. Well, that was fun. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. So those are all of our level one domain cards. Mm-hmm. After that, uh, basically every level that you level up, you get two optional new cards for that level. Per domain. Yep, per domain. So every time you level up. One of them. (laughs) You're going to get one. So every time you level up, you're getting uh, four card options that you're going to select one card from. Mm -hmm. And again, you don't have to pull your level twos. So you can level up to level two and then go back to level one domains and pull, you know, a level one that you thought was interesting. Yep. So if you really want to keep on hammering on Valor and keep on collecting those level one Valor cards, you just keep doing that. Uh, Same thing when you go up to level three. You can always go backwards, which is really, really cool. Um, But yeah, all the way up till max level. um, Every time you level now, it's only two levels per domain or two cards per domain that you're choosing from. Per domain, but you're always going to have two domains to choose from. Yes. Always have two domains. Four choices right there. Yeah. And you're pulling only one. Yep. So, yeah, you're going to be drowning in choices shortly. Yeah. So if you guys want to see any of the higher level domain cards, if that's something that would be interesting to you for us to go over a lot of those, let us know. Yeah. Because we're always interested in reading more cards. 
And man, some of these abilities get wacky zany when you get up there. And, uh, uh, you know, that's a little hint. Valor, still really top (laughs) tier. (laughs) Still really top tier. They only get better. Valor is a super cool domain. Man. But yeah, if that's something you're interested in, let us know. Absolutely. Yeah, if you guys want to see it, we'll do it. But uh, for now, shirt if you want it. Roll for hope. Yeah, roll yeah. for hope. Roll, roll for hope, or go to critical uh, ro- domain. Critical domain. What do you? Oh my, oh my gosh. gosh! It's all. It's been a long day. Yeah. Critroll.com slash foundation is the Critical Role Foundation. If you just Google it. <laughs> yeah. So that way but, you can just donate directly to them. If you exactly. I will have a link to their cool website t-shirt. and a link to the shirt on our description for everything. Yeah. But I want so, a t-shirt. So I don't know about you guys. I mean, you would. You should already have one. <laughs> I should have ordered you one. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, my bad. (laughs) But for now, I've been Tyler. And I've been Richard. And we've been True True Strike. Strike. Bye, everybody. Bye. Hey, Adventures. Thanks again for joining us today. Please be sure to give us a follow on your favorite podcasting platforms and YouTube. If there's any questions you'd like to write in the show, you can hit us up on X, Threads, or Instagram. New episodes release every Tuesday at 2 p.m. Eastern. Thank you for listening to True Strike.